uh, supplied by the other uh, intervention. Um, Vice Director uh, Alessandra Carucci for uh, internationalization is uh, with, together with uh, the director of the Department of Political Science. Uh, has, uh, has, are happy to bring uh, institutional greetings, and so I will leave the floor to Professor Carucci first, and then to Professor Porcu. Alessandra. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here, and I'm also uh, bringing the welcome of our rector, Professor Francesca Omola. Uh, but I'm here as a vice rector for international affairs, and I'm also in charge of all the Erasmus programs. So I'm, I'm very glad, and uh, I congratulate Francesca for having reached this important uh, success with, with this Chamonix chair. Uh, on this such important and uh, actual uh, up-to-date uh, topic, uh, which uh, is will be discussed and uh, um, taken from different point of views uh, with respect to what we are usually um, subject to. Uh, so the climate change from a legal uh, point of view, which is of course a very very important uh, part of the, the topic. Uh, so I'm, I see that today there are uh, some very important uh, uh, foreign uh, hosts and speakers and so I hope that this, uh, this event will be uh, the start of a fruitful collaboration in this uh, in this Jamone chair and that possibly uh, there will be other corporations, maybe in common common projects or uh, even in, in giving participating in the activity of the uh, of this uh, of this chair. Uh, so I, I just wish you uh, a very interesting uh, day and very fruitful discussion. So uh, welcome again and I hope that in the future you will be able to come uh, in person uh, to visit us in Cagliari and having some meetings uh, here in our uh, town and in our region. So have a nice day. And I will, I've, unfortunately, I won't be able to, to attend, to listen to, to uh, this uh, this seminar because I have other other uh, uh, close commitments, but uh, I'm sure it will be very interesting for all the uh, the audience. Thank you again. Have a nice day. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Alessandra. I share, of course, uh, your hope of uh, seeing all these uh, colleagues and friends in, uh, in Cagliari and to host them and other colleagues in the near future. Hopefully that this pandemic will allow us uh, finally to restart uh, a normal or pseudo normal life. <laughs> and so I, I give the floor to Professor Parku that I have to thank twice because he's uh, engaged as a, um, a panelists in, uh, in another conference of our department and, and so I, I just uh, not um, steal uh, any more time so please uh, Mariano the floor is yours and thank you again. Thank you, thank you Francesca. I bring my personal greetings to all the floor and also to the distinguished guests that are here in for, to attend these events. Uh, my greetings are also on behalf of all the staff of the Department of Social and Political Sciences. Uh, this very important event that has been organized uh, by the Jean Monnet Chair conferred to our colleague uh, Francesca Polito, and also because the topic is very important, uh, is a very important issue for, uh, uh, for our future, the climate, climate change. Uh, so it's a pleasure to meet you here. I would like uh, to wish everyone a good job for this uh, intense day of study. Uh, I think I thank uh, once again, uh, Francesca, again congratulations on bringing such a prestigious uh, title as the German Chair to our department. Uh, my thanks are also to Luca Pantaleo for all the work that he's doing uh, in favor of this uh, initiative. As Francesca said, I have to jump to another event where I'm supposed to be one of the speakers. So uh, thank you again, welcome, and I hope that this uh, one step through the resilience uh, to, to recover from this uh, um, pandemic. Good work. 
Uh, thank you a lot, Mariano. Um, I have to welcome the chairman, that is a friend before a colleague and a very expert, uh, Italian expert in the field of uh, international and European environmental law, uh, Professor uh, Lorenzo Schiano di Pepe, who is uh, joined from the University of Genoa. Uh, Lorenzo, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much uh, for uh, your uh, kind uh, introductory words. Uh, thank you very much for your invitation. Uh, congratulations, Francesca, for um, on such an important uh, achievement <coughs> as a, a Jean Monnet uh, chair. This is indeed a very topical issue um, for which there is still uh, too little interest uh, from uh, the legal academic uh, um, world and so it, your initiative is uh, much welcome. It is welcome because of the topic that it intends to uh, address. It is welcome because of the uh, very distinguished speakers that you have brought around this uh, virtual table to um, enlighten us about some of the implications uh, of the many implications that are involved in uh, um, what we call climate um, litigation. If you uh, allow me, uh, Francesca, I will uh, uh, provide uh, uh, the speakers and the um, uh, audience with some uh, uh, directions that we have agreed uh, on, um, some uh, housekeeping. Um, first of all, uh, uh, the idea is that uh, speakers will take the floor for uh, 20 minutes, more or less, and uh, um, I will not be uh, too strict in enforcing this rule, but of course, if I um, realize that someone is taken away by the passion that he or she is putting in her <laughs> arguments, I will take uh, the liberty um, to intervene. Um, secondly, we will have a, a break, uh, I think uh, uh, more or less uh, around uh, um, a little bit after uh, 11 uh, o'clock, but uh, this will depend also on how the um, discussion progresses. Uh, to, uh, this will allow us to uh, drink a, um, a glass of fresh water or a coffee uh, and uh, uh, reflect on what we have just uh, listened to and uh, learned before we convene back for the second half of the uh, program. The, um, we will have three uh, 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 speeches before in the first half of the morning and then a Q&A uh, session for questions relating to uh, the first three uh, presentations, the three first pre the three um, uh, presentations number one, two and three, then um, uh, this break and uh, two final presentations with a final round of uh, uh, Q um, and A. Of course, uh, uh, the um, uh, <coughs> audience is welcome to in the, intervene in the form of uh, uh, Q um, and A of, of, of uh, raising questions. Uh, the best way to indicate the intention to uh, speak is perhaps to use uh, the chat function. I think this is active. Uh, that will allow me to um, see who is willing to uh, put a question to one of the speakers and hopefully also to um, uh, realize what the order uh, is in these uh, requests, line of requests. Um, uh, Francesca, I think this is more or less uh, all for the for this uh, uh, for the time being. Um, so I think we should move uh, without further ado to the uh, substantive part of our um, event. Um, uh, the, um, uh, I'm not sure whether you have mentioned that already because uh, my line was, uh, I was not connected for a brief moment, but the order has, of the speakers has slightly uh, changed. So we will start with uh, uh, Professor uh, Margareta Veverinke. I hope she's uh, uh, there. Uh, thank you. I see now you. Welcome. Uh, welcome. 
to this uh, um, uh, webinar. Um, Silvia is a lecturer of public international law at the Hague University of Applied Sciences, and she is also a researcher um, at the chair of UN United Nations Studies in Peace and Justice, a position which is a chair which is shared between uh, um, Leiden University, Leiden University, and uh, Hague University of Applied uh, Sciences. Um, her research uh, interests. Uh, are in um, the role of indig indigenous women in environmental uh, peace building and justice with uh, a specific focus on the interaction between uh, environmental factors and the root causes of conflicts. Uh, she has also a, a more uh, practical experience having worked with the United Nations backed uh, special Court for Sierra Leone for several years as a legal uh, researcher. Um, she has also um, uh, held uh, um, uh, other positions, uh, including the one of uh, Registrar with the International People's Tribunal on Crimes Against Humanity in, in Indonesia 1965. And finally, she is uh, she has chaired the working group International Protection of Human Rights of the Dutch section of the International Commission of Jurists. Um, it is therefore no um, uh, surprise that uh, the topic of her um, intervention uh, will be uh, land grabbing uh, 2.0, uh, climate forced displacement of indigenous uh, people. Without further ado, uh, Silvia, thanks again for being with us. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much for uh, for this introduction and thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, and having me today. Um, yes, the topic I would like to talk about and let me try to share my slides before I completely forgot about that. Uh, we see them. And let's try to move to presentation mode. This is always a challenge. But let's see, you succeeded. All is in place. OK, oh, and I have moved already. My apologies for that. Um, right, so uh, the topic I'd like to talk about is this climate force displacement of, uh, of indigenous people. Um, so just to to give a little bit of a context to the topic i'd like to talk about is uh, uh what what is it we usually talk about when we are referring to indigenous people as such and the important uh, element there to realize that uh, we consider a certain group of uh, people indigenous because they have their ancestral roots embedded in their traditional lands they have that embedded in the la in the lands they live on or they would like to live on if we are facing already an issue of displacement. And uh, uh, this, uh, this gives them this unique characteristic uh, with this connection to their traditional lands. It is also important to refer to them as people instead simply as community or, or a group, group because by that we acknowledge that this is uh, a, a people which uh, represent a distinct community with a continuity of existence, but it also acknowledges their identity, which is very closely linked to their ancestral roots and uh, uh, traditional lands. So as, uh, as of course you know, uh, there are many different indigenous communities uh, living across the globe, uh, and they all have their own unique characteristics, unique cultural heritage, history, language, uh, all that. But there are some very important commonalities also uh, which we need to uh, recognize. Uh, first of all, every single indigenous community across the globe has this unique connection to the land and to the environment in which they live in. Uh, second of all, uh, every indigenous community uh, is struggling with a history of colonialism um, and uh, a history, a form of oppression. So at some point in history, all indigenous communities have been put under colonial uh, uh, authority and uh, have been struggling with uh, serious levels of, of oppression. And another commonality uh, particularly relevant to, to today's uh, uh, presentation is that every indigenous community 
uh, is disproportionately impacted by environmental factors. Um, when we talk about environmental factors, or when I talk about environmental factors, I, uh, I generally distinguish between resource extraction on the one hand and climate change impact on the other hand. So when we consider uh, extractive pressures, uh, it has been noted by uh, one of the former special reporters on indigenous rights is that uh, this is the most significant source of abuse of rights of indigenous people. Indigenous people reside in uh, remote regions and uh, generally speaking on lands which are extremely rich in various types of resources. And of course, natural resources represent a huge um, um, a financial income for, for governments and, uh, and companies. So indigenous lands are always put on ongoing and quite significant extractive pressure. These extraction activities are generally characterized by heavy handed military practices uh, to uh, protect uh, economic interest of the of the government, economic interest of the of the local authorities. Um, normally these lands, uh, uh, the, the uh, um, acquisition of indigenous lands for extraction practices is done by um, is, is uh, characterized by military um, uh, forces being entrenched to the region uh, to safeguard the economic interest of, of the government. So oppressive governments uh, tend to, uh, the only aim of oppressive governments is to maximize profit, obviously, even if it comes at the cost of already marginalized uh, communities. So um, this is a very disturbing pattern for, for many reasons, uh, but the, uh, one reason I would like to highlight today is uh, this represents a reinforcement of colonial patterns. This represents a situation when these militarized uh, extractive activities are, um, are considering uh, um, uh, indigenous communities as inferior to, to, uh, to the others who are uh, facilitating extraction activities. And when they are opposed, when indigenous communities are opposed to continued extraction of their land and resources, um, they are being silenced uh, and quite often uh, violently silenced. So this is very much this extraction uh, activity is uh, interacting with, with race and ethnicity and uh, tends to reinforce colonial uh, patterns which have been introduced uh, back in, in colonial times. So um, on the other hand, then um, on the top of extractive pressures, we, uh, we, uh, these indigenous communities are increasingly faced with a disproportionate climate impact as well. So when we discuss uh, climate change impact, then the differences between the communities is becoming more important. So on the one hand, we have these similarities, these colonial histories, uh, extractive pressures, when, uh, which is reinforcing colonial patterns and oppression. Uh, but when it comes to climate change impact, the differences between communities are becoming more apparent. Um, because uh, um, climate change impact, uh, of course, well, we don't have to get into much technical details, but it can be either slow or a sudden uh, impact climate change, desertification or sea level rise, Mr. Um, or sea level rise, which we see with Pacific Islands, also is uh, is a slow onset climate impact, which takes for many years to uh, materialize. On the other hand, forest fires or tropical storms, intensive tropical storms or floods, is more, which is a sudden onset uh, climate change impact. So, which of these climate change impacts are being experienced by the various indigenous communities is, of course, very much dependent on the region in which they are residing. So these climate change uh, experiences are going to be very different across indigenous communities. And it's always important to realize which particular climate change impact is impacting the community in question. The other uh, important thing to realize in this context is no matter what the climate change impact may be having this impact on the indigenous community or indigenous people uh, is not an isolated event. Uh, this is not happening uh, in silo. It's not happening. It's not a neutral phenomenon. It is coming on top of 
those heavy extractive pressures that uh, I have been describing um, already. So uh, while, while climate change impact may not be in itself uh, disrupting communities and may not be in itself causing uh, loss of land uh, on a large scale or, or leading to displacement, when it interacts with these uh, serious extractive pressure, but also these patterns of colonialism, this pattern of oppression, this pattern of silencing indigenous people, it's really becoming a serious issue. So um, whatever the climate change impact may, may be uh, on, on the region, uh, it always intersects with these pre-existing pre -existing private dynamics when the focus is on capitalism, maximizing uh, uh, profit and the protection of capital rather than the protection of uh, marginalized communities and already existing environmental damage which has been caused by res uh, resource uh, activities. So um, when uh, when we consider this, uh, like we take this this 360 degree uh, look at the at the situation, then we realize that uh, climate change impact interacts with these uh, pre-existing pressures and environmental damage, and it is the uh, result uh, of that that it leads to increasing uh, loss of lands, disruption of traditional livelihoods and pushing indigenous people further into, into forced displacement because of the climate change impact. So um, uh, perhaps just to, to clarify a little bit more how these, uh, these various um, uh, concepts work out together, I would like to refer uh, a research that I've been able to conduct a few years back in, uh, uh, in West Papua on the island of New Guinea. Um, and the western half of the island of New Guinea is currently controlled by uh, Indonesia and uh, this western half of the island of New Guinea, the eastern half is the independent state of Papua New Guinea. But in the western half, uh, back in the 1960s, decolonization uh, has not been uh, completed properly according to the UN standards. We have seen that in 1960, uh, in the, during the 1960s, the decolonization process got frustrated very much by um, economic interests uh, which are represented in, in, West New, uh, in West New Guinea. Because the territory of West New Guinea is extremely rich, uh, among other things, in gold and copper. Um, and uh, in order to exploit these, uh, these resources, um, West New, uh, the process of decolonization has become uh, frustrated by Indonesia, who has claimed the territory and is uh, uh, controlling the territory ever since, contrary to, uh, to UN standards uh, on decolonization. So uh, ever since this frustrated process of decolonization, uh, the territory has been put under extreme uh, uh, extraction pressures, which has led to the situation where we see a, a large presence, a significant presence of military forces and uh, uh, even private security forces on the territory uh, to so-called protect Indonesian economic interest. Uh, indigenous Papua communities have continuously uh, opposed to, were continuously opposed to Indonesian rule and of course also to these uh, extreme levels of resource extraction on their lands. Um, and they have been silenced by, violently by, uh, by Indonesian military forces. Um, all, all those decades uh, since the 1960s, uh, so there's been continuous extractive pressures uh, during those decades, which has uh, led to an uh, extensive environmental degradation and loss of lands of, uh, of indigenous uh, people. So in that sense, we see that resource extraction in uh, West Papua is heavily militarized. Uh, and as such, it's a significant contributing factor to violence and displacement of indigenous people living on the territory. At the same time, uh, Vespapo is also experiencing increasing climate change impact, where we see various patterns of uh, changing weather and extreme weather events. Uh, with heavy rainfalls, for example, causing flash floods and land landslides. Uh, perhaps you have seen more recently in the news that this was a serious issue also in Australia, uh, which has experienced serious floods uh, just uh, a few weeks ago. 
So we see all these uh, these extremes uh, taking place, and then uh, all of that is very closely connected to uh, this uh, large scale extraction and and more more importantly unsound extraction practices, um, because uh, deforestation intensifies uh, causing landslides and intensifies the damage that is being caused by the landslides. Uh, just to name one example. So um, because of these extreme weather events and extreme uh, changing weather patterns, um, traditional livelihoods of the indigenous communities, which have already been become very much limited and severely uh, damaged because of the extraction practices, it's going even further the damage that is being caused. Uh, food and water sources are depleting. There is no access to food, no access to safe water. Um, and people are forced to relocate, people are forced to move away from, uh, from their traditional lands. And this uh, coming on top of those military practices and militarized extraction activities is further exacerbating already existing tensions, uh, which is playing uh, uh, out uh, as a form of a conflict on two different levels. Because on the one hand, it fuels intertribal uh, tensions, intertribal conflict between the various uh, tribes as uh, sources of food and sources of water becoming uh, more and more scarce that fuels conflict between the various uh, communities, various tribes. But it also feeding into this uh, um, political instability because of this failed process of decolonization, and it also increases the level of mistrust towards the uh, the uh, Indonesian government. So, um, just to name a few examples, when we're talking about these environmental factors, resource extraction on the one hand, and climate change impact on the other hand. Uh, disproportionately impacting indigenous people, it has a major impact on various indigenous uh, rights. And I would just like to, for the sake of time, highlight few examples there. Uh, to start with, we have this 1998 uh, guiding principles on internal displacement, which puts an obligation, an international obli uh, obligation on states to prevent and avoid conditions leading to displacement. And uh, principle six, for example, from these guiding principles is referring in general to this obligation to prevent and avoid. Uh, but principle nine is referring specifically to indigenous communities. So that's, uh, that's an example of uh, a violation of rights. Um, another example is in Article 11 of the International Covenant on the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, uh, which provides for the right to an adequate standard of living, including food, clothing, housing um, as well. And there are various uh, general comments which have been issued with regards to this particular right in the covenant. Um, for example, general comment number 12, uh, which is, uh, specifically points to, with regard to adequate food, for example, specifically points to that the, the food, the adequate food must be acceptable within a given culture, which is a very important element for indigenous peoples. But also general comment number seven, uh, which, uh, which is addressing the issue of forced evictions in general, and it has noted that indigenous people in particular suffer disproportionately from the practice of forced evictions and it should receive priority from, from the state's party to, uh, to the international covenant. But then also a more recent uh, development, uh, uh, the UN General Assembly Resolution 64 292, which has recognized the right to save drinking water. And there have been other documents also recognizing this particular right which is being violated uh, when uh, uh, indigenous people are, because of climate change impact, have no access basically to safe drinking water. And then we have uh, Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Article 15 uh, again of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Um, which, and there are many other provisions uh, referring to the same right the right to access and enjoy cultural heritage, uh, the right to engage in one's own cultural practices. Again, this is a very important provision 
for indigenous uh, people, given that uh, the unique uh, connection with their uh, uh, ancestral roots and cultural practices stemming from those ancestral roots. Um, and this is very closely uh, connected to Article 31 of the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous People, because that article uh, sets specific standards for cultural rights of Indigenous people, referring to uh, maintain, control, protect and develop. Indigenous people have the right to maintain, control, protect and develop the cultural uh, practices, but also traditional knowledge. And this traditional knowledge is becoming really, really important in the context of climate change uh, resilience and climate change adaption and mitigation. Uh, but just to name one uh, one example, uh, the special uh, another one other example, the special reporter on cultural rights has also noted that the impact of climate change on cultural rights must be addressed as a matter of priority. That is a more recent document. OK, so um, I see that this uh, this uh, uh, situation stemming from uh, climate change impact and it's interacting with uh, colonial history and resource extraction practices on indigenous land, increasingly leading to forced displacement of indigenous people. Um, and then uh, we need to think what is the importance of this uh, uh, indigenous knowledge? Uh, with regard to their own lands and own uh, environment. So every time an indigenous people uh, are being displaced or uh, their traditional livelihoods are being disrupted and destroyed because of the environmental degradation, this type of environmental insecurity weakens their ability massively to cope with uh, uh, those loss of lands and also to adapt to uh, climate change impact. And that is uh, particularly disturbing uh, for, for multiple reasons, and not just because uh, it's leading to the loss of cultural rights and cultural practices of indigenous people as such, but it's also led to the loss of indigenous environmental knowledge, which is uh, crucial for climate change resilience for all of us, because um, we have been discussing uh, at the beginning of this presentation, I was referring to one of the commonalities of indigenous people across the world is that they all have this very unique connection to the environment and to the lands in which they live. And this tight physical and spiritual connection they have with their own lands and environment suggest uh, proven adaptation uh, methods to the changing climate. This, uh, it suggests that indigenous communities are the best positioned uh, to observe the change to the environment and uh, know how to adapt to those changes in the environment. So this creates this very unique knowledge about the environment. So indigenous practices in response to extreme uh, weather events, for example, suggest, uh, um, suggest uh, effective uh, adaptation uh, methods. And that's an important element we need to realize that the integration of indigenous knowledge uh, into scientific knowledge, uh, scientific knowledge about climate change regulations is still lacking uh, and it's crucial for us to uh, to reflect on this uh, specific unique knowledge indigenous people have about the land and environment. So um, I have not been keeping the time, so I'm not sure whether I still have more to discuss, but in any event, uh, I'd like to uh, close with, uh, with a quote and from this picture, which I have taken in, uh, uh, in New Guinea. Uh, and when I was uh, talking to uh, to the uh, to the community there, uh, uh, one one person said that if the forest is large and strong, we can live long and strong. And that was a line which has stayed with me. Uh, I think it's going to stay with me for the rest <laughs> of my life. Um, so I thought that that would be a powerful message also here to end with that. Thank you very much for your patience and attention. Uh, thank, thank you very much, much. Sylvia. Yes. Uh, uh, Inge was in was fact, fact. Uh, I think, I think someone should close. Someone has uh, his or her mic open. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, your uh, your presentation was in fact uh, um, uh, enlightening in showing how it can be said. In fact, and you have demonstrated it that. Um, 
displacement amounts to a certain uh, uh, reboot of uh, land grabbing. It's not the land grabbing that we were used to. It is more concealed, perhaps, than it used to be, but it is in fact happening and um, uh, there may be or there is a direct link that um, makes, a, makes us think of the indirect effects of uh, climate change that may not find so easily their way into a litigation because of the difficulties in proving or demonstrating a um, uh, causal link between uh, uh, the origins of uh, a certain displacement and the displacement itself. So I find that uh, um, if we look at your presentation from the perspective of a practitioner, you show uh, you showed uh, the um, difficulty that um, uh, one can encounter in evidence gathering to some extent uh, in, in being, building up a, a, climate, uh, a climate case. Thanks, thanks a lot again. Uh, I'm pretty sure that there will be questions uh, for you. We uh, can now move to, her, um, to our third speaker, um, uh, Professor Christina Ickes. Um, uh, she uh, uh, um, obtained, uh, here you are, she obtained uh, degrees um, in, in, at, in, um, at King's College uh, London uh, um, and as well as at the Collège d'Europe in Bruges uh, as a student. So, um, fully uh, qualified European law um, uh, um, student uh, in her past. Of course, she then moved on and she held uh, positions as a lecturer at the University of Surrey, uh, Surrey and uh, um, later and today she is a professor of European Union, uh, European law, uh, European law at the University of Amsterdam where she is also the director of the Amsterdam Center for European Law and uh, Governance. Um, her research interests and publication are mostly focused nowadays on the internal constitutional consequences of the European uh, Union external uh, action. Uh, she used to uh, write, um, uh, she, she authored numerous publications on um, uh, European Union restrictive uh, measures, sanctions, topic that unfortunately is now again on the top of everybody's agenda. More, more recently, uh, she has been the recipient of a, a North Face uh, uh, grant, a very interesting topic for which she is currently conducting uh, research uh, on the issue of separation of powers for 21st century. Center. Europe. Europe. Um, um, again, I see uh, uh, return in my. Okay, now it's uh, going back again. Um, um, the uh, topic that she will be speaking uh, on is also a very interesting one: uh, constitutional legitimacy of climate uh, litigation. So, um, uh, thanks for being with us uh, this morning. Christina, if I may, uh, the floor is yours without further ado. Many thanks, many thanks, uh, Lorenzo, many thanks, uh, Francesca, for having me. I will not waste more of my time to thank you, but I'm very happy to be here and have the discussion now. I need to share my slides. Permission. Yes, I think both you and I earned a degree in IT this morning. Very good. So is this already the presentation mode or not yet? It is indeed. OK, perfect. Many thanks um, also for assisting me to get started. So um, you introduced me very much as an EU law expert, which is probably true. But since 2019, I am very much focused also on climate litigation. And I changed the title of my presentation, I must say, also just to identify what I'm talking about. So it's still about the constitutional legitimacy. The title would still in general be OK, but I will focus in particular on the use of science and the role of politics in strategic climate litigation. 
And I will take a moment to explain this to you. My slides are moving, right? Yeah. They are. Okay, perfect. Um, because you can easily divide climate cases into categories and many people have worldwide within Europe but one way of dividing them is between strategic and non-strategic climate cases and the strategic climate cases are usually seen as cases where litigants pursue common interests interests beyond their personal interests and these are of course the cases that most people focus on because they have the greatest impact on the political system if you like then you can divide, and that's what I did in this slide. Is it still visible? Because now it disappeared on my screen. Now you are now sharing your screen, and uh, we see uh, what you see, uh, which is not um, yeah. the slides, yeah. but uh, the audience, basically. Yeah. Well, how did that? It just happened by itself. I didn't touch anything. So let's hope that stays now. You are back on track with the slide. Back on track, back on track. So here's the uh, typology that I would like to share with you. And I want to focus really on the second row. So both columns in the second row. And the distinction that I make here is first of all between states and private actors. And we have seen many more strategic cases against states so far, about 40, slightly more than 40 in the lower category. We also have strategic climate cases in the upper category, which is sectorial litigation. So litigation concerning specific aspects, such as an authorization to extract um, coal or oil or gas, or an authorization to run a mine. These were typical cases against states in the first column, first row. I will not focus on those, but they are also very important and they are locally very important. And then we have in the first row, first column, um, cases against um, private actors, so hence companies, usually multinationals. And here we are looking at corporate liability. We are looking at um, specific aspects of climate adaptation, for example, where companies are asked to pay. We are looking at cases for fiduciary duties. We are looking at um, cases, um, yeah, relying um, to their activities in specific local areas. What I will be looking at is the second row, so hence the 40 plus uh, systemic mitigation cases as they have been dubbed several times, so cases that aim at an overall emission reduction by states. And I will also touch upon the Dutch Shell case in the second column, second row, so hence um, general adaptation, uh, general mitigation case against uh, private actor. So this is one way of trying to um, categorize them and many many people have and I will focus on how that interacts with separation of powers. What is the role of the judiciary? How far should judges go? What are their tools that they could use? And I will start there for a second typology here where I identify in the first column, first row, hence cases against states, what instruments have been used, what arguments have been used by the parties. And in the first uh, um, row, you see NL, the Netherlands, Urgenda, the first case that I will be speaking out about most. And we see it was um, based on human rights, it was based on civil law, hence tort obligations, and it relied heavily on international law and science. So science in that case was relying on the IPCC. And you can see when you go down in the row, the first next one is Ireland, that what we can conclude, the next one, Germany, France and Italy is of course a pending case. I've included it since um, we are technically speaking in Italy here, um, that all of them rely heavily on international law and science, all systemic mitigation cases. Many of them also rely on human rights, but not all of them. And then you can see particularities. Is there national legislation? Was there a state policy objective like in Germany um, asking the state to take actually climate action? And of course the question, and that is something that we will hear more about, I suppose at the end of these presentations is to what extent is agenda also a template by, um, for the use of uh, civil law? Um, to bring climate cases. So I was planning to say a bit more about that, but then I saw that we have a specific designated speaker on that, so I will 
uh, leave that for Q&A or maybe for a later discussion. So let's start with agenda. It is definitely the big bang of climate litigation, 2015. It's the first case brought against the state for general emission reduction, and it's of course the first successful state, uh, successful case. So in three instances in the Netherlands, um, the litigants, the Agenda Foundation, supported by a large number of uh, 800 something uh, individuals, won this case in, um, in the Dutch courts. But how do I get now? Um, uh, writing on that slide because as far as I can see you don't have writing on the slide so how do I get writing on this slide That's maybe if you move better. the slide uh, more actions um if translate you, yes yes it works what did that happen ah here I can click on it very good sorry um teams is really a new challenge for us so I want to just cite a few um quotes from the agenda case that highlight why this case is particular and why this case has had such a high, you can say, copycat effect or such a high, uh, why it could be copied in so many ways, why it has been relied on in so many other countries and why it has been so uh, salient in that respect more than the following cases in many respects. And it starts with the fact that the court spends a large number of pages on explaining the danger of climate change. So it is really a legal authoritative fact finding that the court explains how dangerous climate change is. So it says the genuine threat of dangerous climate change constitutes a real and immediate risk. It says it has um, a, it is a threat to the lives and welfare of Dutch residents. So it also pulls it to Dutch residents. In this case in particular, we don't um, yet discuss or we don't have uh, evidence yet of the future generations and um, non-Dutch residents. Um, and it says, and that is also very important, it is an exceptional situation. So when you read the case, you have a sense that the judge basically establishes that climate change is really the, at the moment, foreseeable only context in which the judiciary would go that far. And some people have argued that. Is that reasonable? Can you argue that? Can you say that the judiciary can step can take an extra step in interfering in politics, if you want to phrase it um, negatively, because of the exceptional situation. What is also interesting is, of course, that the only thing that the court does is establish a minimum obligation to reduce emissions. And that minimum obligation from today's perspective, only two years later, 2022, seems very low. 25% huh? reduction in compared to 1990 levels in 2020. None of the cases that are brought today, none of the cases that were brought later would um, allow for such a low threshold. That was, of course, because it was brought in 2015 when we didn't have um, the same agreement on um, yeah, the objective of 1.5 degrees that we have now since Glasgow, at least written into the uh, COP27. So things have evolved since um, a low threshold. So in that sense, one could say it didn't go as far as we would expect the case to go today. And what is very important in the case is that the court made very clear the reason why it ruled against the state is because the state did not establish re a reasonable explanation why it didn't do what was necessary. So it was asked time and again to advance reasons for why it did not reduce emissions as it agreed it would. And there was no scientific or other arguments brought forward. The case of the state, of course, tried to rely on arguments on geoengineering and such technologies, as in some other cases that I will refer to quickly uh, in, the, in, in my later presentation. But it didn't advance convincing reasons. And I think that's also a very important point because we must ask ourselves what can the judiciary legitimately do in this and asking for reasonable explanation is in my view one of its core tasks as I will argue later. It also has two particularities. The first is the prohibition to order legislation. So under Dutch law um, the judiciary is prohibited to order the legislature to take action which is something that not all um, judiciary systems have. I for example was um, well, as a lawyer raised and bred in Germany, where this is no problem, we can uh, the German Constitutional Court can indeed order the legislature to take action. Um, but this is, if you like, 
an element of protecting separation of powers in the Netherlands. What we do have, of course, in the Netherlands, and that is also very particular, and I mean, there are many particularities. I should maybe add that every climate case, every strategic climate case, every climate case in general, is of course subject to the judi judicial um, particularities. So in every country it's different, and in every country you must consider different rules. But the two things that stand out is here the, um, the standing for public interest organizations. So that in the Netherlands, public interest organizations may advance a common interest as long as they're founded and it's within their mandate and whatever, they can bring it to court, which is something that is clearly not possible in all other jurisdictions or in many jurisdictions it is more difficult. So, I mean, we could think there again of uh, Germany, we could think of, um, of uh, the European Union, if you like. Other climate cases that have been advanced since and that have strongly relied on agenda in different ways is Ireland, Germany and France. And I have highlighted here, uh, oh no, I haven't highlighted here, but I was meant to highlight here, in which way the agenda team, I, I colored it yellow, but it sort of disappeared on the slide. But you will see agenda nonetheless on the slide. So in Ireland, we have a case where, the net, where a national law existed and the government should develop a plan on how to reduce emissions. And the main claim was that that plan was very vague, unspecific and did not meet the requirements of the law as it was um, presented. And um, yeah, the, the, the government lost, so it, has to present, it had to present a, a more specific plan. But what is important in the Irish case, and I'm only highlighting important aspects, so we can discuss any other aspect that you would like in Q&A, is that it moved from the agenda point of reduction of 25% in 2020 to a trajectory. So it, it took the first step, the Irish courts, to think about emissions as a whole. And we will see that is the next step that the German Constitutional Court took even more, more explicitly by talking about a national carbon budget. So we are no longer talking about a reduction perspective, uh, percentage in a certain given year in Agenda 2020, but we are talking about a carb, national carbon budget in Germany before the German Constitutional Court. And that changes the perspective in the sense that that is what it is about, because all emissions we have uh, uh, already let, uh, that have already um, escaped into the into the atmosphere, we can't capture back. So they will have effects for years to come. So even if you reduce in a certain year by a certain uh, percentage, that doesn't mean that you that you do your fair share, that you stay within your national carbon budget, because it in principle would allow states to continue having increased emissions up to that legal obligation in a given year, 2030, 2050. And we will see that that is a development that has happened since agenda. So Ireland is speaking about an emission reduction trajectory and the German Constitutional Court um, in 2021 established actually that um, there is a national carbon budget that it uh, drew out. Also the German Constitutional Court, while relying heavily on agenda, referring a lot to also the fact finding in, in agenda, um, included future generations. So that is also a development of the German Constitutional Court. Ireland relied less heavily on agenda, but the claimant actually did rely very heavily on agenda and it was supported by the agenda team. So um, you see that even if it's not fully visible in the judgment, agenda also in the practical sense had a lot of impact. The same is true for Italy, where we have um, a climate or climatic obligation um, that have been established um, under a number of international um, and European norms. But here also a gender team has been, has been active behind the scenes. Uh, in France, slightly on the side, but also an interesting case, a case interesting for different aspects. It also concerned a national law, so that is slightly easier, if you like, and also easier to, to argue in terms of democratic, um, in terms of democratic legitimacy, as we will see. So let's move to the European courts just for a second. And here we have uh, two cases that are worth mentioning. One is still pending, and that's the one before the Strasbourg Court, so the Court um, of Human Rights. And we have the case before the European Court of Justice that has been rejected in 2021. And what is interesting is what I said is that the emission reductions that are required before court have increased tremendously. So you see here that what was asked in 
um, Carvalho is a reduction by 50 to 60% in 2030 as compared to Agenda 25 and 2020. Um, so if you like, the demands brought before courts are rising. So it means that courts would demand, have to demand more of states if cases were brought now. Whatever you, you know, I mean, there's of course good reasons for that, which we have heard in the uh, second presentation in particular. I'm not arguing that it's not well argued, but that is something to keep in mind. The case failed on the admissibility criteria of individual concern, so clearly also something that is directly linked to questions of separation of powers, namely the question, can individuals challenge general norms, generally applicable norms in the EU? And that is very difficult, not impossible, but very difficult. That was failed on. And we have the Strasbourg Court, which is interesting for many other reasons. First of all, two things. Many NGOs oppose the Strasbourg uh, case because it is based on the reasoning that there is no adequate domestic remedy. And that is, of course, if you like, disqualifying further cases that come after the Strasbourg Court. I mean, it's a bit more nuanced. They make a strong argument on the urgency of climate change and the fact that cases would take too long. So they have to make this argument to avoid the exhaustion of remedy rule before the Strasbourg Court. So basically be able to bring a case immediately and not have to wait to go through all instances in national courts, which is the general rule before the Strasbourg Court. And so they make a strong argument that the urgency of climate change or the climate crisis, the climate emergency, um, justifies where they could go immediately to the Strasbourg Court. What is also interesting in this case is the Commission intervention, because the Commission says, no, no, but there are ways of challenging, um, of, of bringing climate cases also before the EU, and they say the future will be preliminary rulings. So we have a series of uh, instruments adopted under the uh, EU law, basically making legally binding the political commitments under the European Green Deal, and the, and the expectation that the Commission voices in this third party intervention, and I think it's a reasonable in, um, expectation, is that the number of preliminary rulings, hence national courts asking questions to the Court of Justice, is another entry point into the EU for the future. Then we have Royal Dutch Shell, and then I will be done with uh, running with you through cases, then we will try to draw some conclusions and analyze them. And this is a case um, that is brought against the private party. As I said, it was in my in my table on the right hand side. So it is a different type of case. You need to think about it slightly differently. But it was based also on a large extent on agenda. So agenda was constantly referred also because it's of course in the same jurisdiction, namely in the Netherlands. What it established is uh, that there's a substantive financial risk as a result of climate change. So it really moved it into the 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 realm of of relevance for for private companies it addressed scope three emissions so not just the emissions of shell itself as a company of its own actions but also the consumer emissions so hence from shell selling its products hence fossil fuel and uh, energy to its um to its consumers and that's a big step to establish that i mean many people have challenged the um, legal reasoning in this case it is still pending now in uh, appeal, so we don't know where it's going, but in the first instance, this is what has been established. And it also was based, similar to the Irish case, similar to the German case, on the fact that the Shell company did not have concrete plans for reducing emissions, that it had uh, high-flying, far-reaching goals for the future of, of, of even uh, um, zero emissions or so, so, uh, net neutrality, but um, it was undefined, intangible and non-binding plans for the long term. So that was one of the core criticisms. It did rely on the non-binding targets under the Paris Agreement very heavily, as Agenda did, and what is um, interesting in this uh, case, it went even further in discussing the scientific findings of the IPCC. So it specifically discussed probabilities. And that is interesting when we see in how, how science is used in these cases, because between science and law, there's of course an inherent tension that law is to a large extent, at least when it comes to courts, huh? 
binary. So either something is legal or illegal. The court has to come down on one side. Either there is an obligation or there's none. While science is, of course, comfortable and able to deal with probabilities. So say, um, as the IPCC set does, there's whatever, 50% chance to stay below 1.5 degrees if we do the following, if the following is reduced. And I think um, that is an inherent tension when science is used in, in, in courts, and we must be aware of that, that the judge is then asked, so what is illegal? What probability is illegal and what probability is still legal? And that inherent tension, I think, has still been insufficiently um, explored in climate litigation. So, but let me move to the question of actually my presentation after giving you a run through these cases, and that is, what are the constitutional implications? So, what does it mean? And my my thesis is that really these cases are the litmus test of separation of powers. At the moment, in within the European Union, in any event, there are no cases that go as far as asking the judge to establish from law obligations on the basis of arguments and instruments that require a lot of interpretation and give the judge hence a very broad discretion. And I want to st st uh, start why that is. On the one hand, this is the case because of the exceptional situation of a threat to humanity that is scientifically established. When we read the IPCC, this is established with scientific certainty in probabilities, but in with scientific certainty that these probabilities exist of what the threat to humanity is and the political paralysis that follows from the fact that it's a truly global collective action problem so that basically yeah there's no point in forcing the Netherlands to reduce emissions for climate change uh, globally that is also an argument that the court has made the drop in the ocean argument it is often called so basically saying our emissions are just so negligibly small that um, it doesn't make any difference whether we reduce them or not. So that is how it turns out as a truly global collective action problem that the, the policy changes of one state are just factually being, of course, linked, having an impact, but that impact, of course, uh, on a global scale is small. And um, the second point is that those most affected um, have no political say. We have seen this very vividly in the second presentation, so I will not spend a lot of time on it. But it's, of course, also true for not just future generations, but also those who are not who are not yet of voting age. So what we call the birth cohorts, that they are impacted very differently. And of course, what we saw in the second presentation, not with regard to age, but with regard to um, uh, origin, that there's a tremendous north south um, divide, that there's a tremendous divide in where you live, what are your circumstances, and how you're affected by climate impacts. And we can reasonably conclude that in most of the cases, or all of the cases that I discuss here, which are brought in rich industrialized countries, um, in these jurisdictions, the most affected have no political say and will also not have a political say, not even over time. Um, and the second reason, so on the one hand, it's the particularity of the problem, which leads to political paralysis, because those living in the Netherlands today have to make a tremendous effort, and arguably they have difficulties to see what the cost brings in terms of benefit because of the global action problem and because they're not themselves affected. And I keep it to the Netherlands because that's where I am, and I spoke a lot about agenda. It's the same, it's the same of course, in all the other countries. And the other, um, aspect is what legal arguments and instruments the courts rely on, the claimants rely on, and then as a result, the courts rely on. And there's two things to, to emphasize is the open textured norms, human rights were mentioned, but uh, human rights cases are shared, but not all of them, but also duties of care, state objectives, and um, non-binding international norms. So even in binding treaties, we heard the Paris Agreement, of course, a binding treaty, bottom up, we have heard several times in the first presentation, to determine uh, nationally determined uh, contributions. And the targets are, however, seen as non-binding. Hence, they are used to give flesh to binding national obligations of an open textured nature for example, human rights or duty of care, different in different jurisdictions. 
And finally, science. And I've already mentioned a, a course tension between law and science. Scientific insights are something that are heavily relied on, and that also puts a burden on the judge to make choices. And I will return to that in a moment. First to the political paralysis. What is most important for me to highlight, and I will speed a tiny bit up so that we actually do have a break, um, is that in all the cases I mentioned, in absolutely all the cases, the courts criticized politics for not taking sufficient action. We can see here that uh, in agenda it was said that there was no proper sub substantiation of the national uh, policies. We can see that in the agenda case, the um, highest Dutch civil court said that a postponement would, um, yeah, would lead to a situation where we need to make up for that postponement in the future, both in, and that is highly problematic for future rights. The same is true for Germany in the, in the very last um, paragraph, where the German Constitutional Court said that there's an inherent tension between short-term election cycles and long-term vision protecting environmental interests. Future generations were protected, those who will be most affected. affected. And um, so the acknowledgement that politics is failing to address this um, this problem. And Ireland finally saying that the public has a right to know, has a right to know what are the concrete steps. It's not sufficient for Ireland to say in 2030, we will just have this beautiful uh, net zero emission state, but to say, so what are you doing now and today to get there? So um, that is a, a joint feature of all the cases. That's the only thing I want to establish. So it, it, it confirms that the problem is exceptional and that it's a political challenge that raises exceptional challenges. The second point I want to establish is the use of science. And here it is, of course, important to realize that we are using different types of sciences. So first of all, in the center of all of it is the IPCC and the IPCC reports. OK, here I still mentioned 2021. 2022, um, the IPCC reports established the how unique the climate emergency is, it both in degree and in kind, and it is also politically endorsed, and that is important. So it's not just it, it is it is often set aside as as a scientific body or set aside is maybe wrong. It's it's of course a scientific body. It establishes what current science is. It does not conduct its own science but really takes stock of what the, the state of science is. And that state of science is politically endorsed. At least the summary findings are endorsed by all the political parties. So the core point is it is not just science. It is also um, intergovernmental body. And that is important to realize. In addition, many of the cases of the cases, the judges referred to national bodies, national bodies using the science of the IPCC and establishing either national um, readings of them, so national carbon budgets, or establishing um, yeah, na within their national legal authority state objectives, like in Germany. Finally, we have the open text of norms that I already mentioned, so I will not say much about that, but Science is used to give flesh to them, and that is normal. That is what happens, because always when you have an open textured norm, and that is important to realize, it is filled in based on empirical insights. So the fact that science is used to fill in what human rights mean, what is the obligation, what is the duty of care, is absolutely what is happening all the time. When we wonder why is it, uh, what is the, 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 the um, acceptable speed limit somewhere, we do that on the basis of insights on how does the car break, how did it break in the specific situation, what was a reasonable duty of care, how was it exercised, how shall we protect someone from a dangerous, um, from a dangerous machine of any sort. Um, and then we of course have, uh, we must acknowledge that nonetheless there's always normative questions. Normative questions in how the science is established. So that is something that we cannot get around. No one can. I mean, anyone who works uh, at a university knows that even a legal inquiry, any inquiry, legal or other, huh, whatever sort of inquiry is subject to scope and method choices. And these are normative choices. Yeah, there's no other way. And that is, of course, also true for the IPCC. 
And finally, and that is an important point that judges also have made, and I think most obviously probably the agenda case again, there's a difference between reasonable and rational. A rational action is that we could expect the defendants to act in light of science. So if we say you need to re reduce emissions to zero today in order to do your best to avoid a scientifically certain threat to your population, that's probably the most rational choice. But they must act reasonable. So they must be able to argue in light of scientific certainty why they take certain choices. But that can entail, and that's the difference between reasonable and rational, and a balance of interests. So other interests, industry interests, whatever, employment interests, whatever else they can advance. But they must do so in light of established science. And that is something that is really the court of the role of courts that we will get to. Normative choices, I already mentioned them, they've also been expressed by, by, I think, the Irish court, the best saying that any scientific certainty does not have legal certain obligations, but that that requires a step of translation. So what is now the role of the judiciary in all these cases? What can the judiciary do? What can we expect from it? And first of all, I must say, I deal with climate litigation because it is a so legal and social factor. I, I, I by no means say it should be for the judiciary to do this. I'll be more than happy if politics were acting by themselves. Um, so my question is more in light of the political paralysis, how can judges bring a contribution, make a contribution in this context? And I think we must take a step back and think about separation of powers. Separation of powers is not a value in itself. It's nowhere mentioned in the EU treaties. It is not mentioned in many consti national constitutions, in some, but, not in, but in most it isn't. It is a value that serves a different value, usually seen as the rule of law, democracy, the values that separation of power serves. And I think it can be reduced. I mean, Bruce Ackerman framed this, uh, the I mean, maybe the phrase that is most known about separation of powers is the question, separation of powers for what? So what does it serve? What is it meant to do? And it is meant to facilitate will formation. So hence the fact that polities can make decision move forward, establish uh, decisions, that there's a protected realm for politics to move forward, that there's potentially input of the other branches to do so, and control. So control that no one oversteps what they're meant to do. So, and it's a relational concept. It's a concept where all the branches should have a reasonable independence, but at the same time, they're interdependent. So they must not undermine each other's legitimacy which would harm decision making for the future, irrespective of how exceptional our challenge might be, but must see that we remain, yeah, uh, that the problem solving capacity of the state is not damaged through whatever intervention we are doing in the individual case. It limits majoritarianism, sorry. It, it limits majoritarianism, so it's an accepted feature of constitutional democracy that we accept that judges may set some or other limits that we protect individual autonomy from the decision of the majority. It ultimately is there to perpetuate the tension between the branches so that no, none of the branches dominates the other permanently. And that's a core point. We should not have a situation where one branch permanently has the last word, because that's the whole idea of separation of powers, that we don't have a guardian of the guardians, that we don't have one branch determining for now and forever, what the political position is, but that there's an exchange, an ongoing exchange. And some people have framed it as a sep um, separated agonism, which I find a very nice term. So the idea that any yeah, dissent, any antagonism is channeled institutionally into the system, that it is possible, for example, as we have seen in pretty much every climate case, maybe standing out um, the Portuguese children's case before the Strasbourg court, but also the youth case in Norway, but also in Italy, a share of minors participating in the case, so that those who don't have political power yet can come in through the court system and bring their voice in, for example. So that dissent that doesn't find an echo in the political system is brought back into the system in a tamed form, in a form of institutionalization, so not destructive of the system, but within the rules of the system. So that I think is the core point behind it. And in that, judges have a role to ask for justification. So that that parliaments or executives, the state in agenda, 
cannot do what they do without offering reasons. Reasons in particular if human rights infringements are established. And uh, Rainer Force, for example, has written on this, the right to justification, that whenever your rights are restricted, when your individual autonomy is limited, that you have a right to be given reasons, that that is the core of um, the democratic reasons, uh, reasoning. And that is something that uh, cases can do. Bring in the science in a very different way than in politics, where it is brushed aside, where we still have climate change deniers, even though in small part in uh, national parliaments. And what did courts do? I think we have seen that they have been very mindful of their role. In Germany, the German Constitutional Court emphasized the role of the legislature to take action, that it couldn't be for the executive to establish uh, where we're going alone. And we have um, Ireland saying the public must know, so that's, uh, that, that burden, it, it placed an information burden on the Irish government. And we have, of course, in France, and that's why I brought the case in, which I haven't spoken about a lot, uh, Grand Sint, the situation where a, a local executive challenges the national executive. So basically where even within one branch, there is um, in a multi-layered system, checks and balances and decision making. But I mean, I will keep that short in interest of time because uh, I'm surprised that I haven't been interrupted as yet. Um, enabling politics. So another point that I want to add is that we should, of course, be mindful of the non-binding international norms. We should be mindful of the science and the extension of the discretion of the judge. But all of the cases also brought it back to ordinary national laws in one way or another. So there is hooks, there is basis on which the judges decide. And we have national climate laws in Ireland, for example. We have the uh, in Germany, the Climate Klimaschutzgesetz. We have state policy objectives in the Constitution that exactly specifically speaks to protecting the environment. And we have national interpretation of fundamental rights. So past interpretations of courts in how um, fundamental rights should be um, interpreted. So as any other judge, the judges in the climate cases try to place their decisions in a coherent form on the legal order, benefiting from the legitimacy of the whole legal order. And we, of course, have plenty of political endorsements, international commitments of the government, accepting climate change being a major threat in all possible ways. And we have um, the IPCC that I spoke about, scientific and intergovernmental. And we have, finally, the permanent tension between abstract commitments and concrete realization. So one question is, how far can judges go to ask politics to meet their own abstract commitments in terms of concrete plans? And that is, of course, something that also came up in Ireland, in Germany, and, the, and many German uh, constitutional lawyers have said that that is where they criticize the, the German Court of Justice, uh, the, the German Constitutional Court, for being too specific, for asking for a too high level of specificity. And I think this is exactly where, yeah, where a certain danger lies and where we have to be very careful in many ways, namely how far can you go to, to ask for specificity. Red lines can be drawn, red lines were drawn by agenda the minimum level, but that is of course to an extent really, uh, yeah, saying what is illegal, how far you cannot go. The, the distinction between what and how in agenda very well respected. Uh, what needs to be done? Emissions need to be reduced. How? That is really for politics to decide. Which sector? Do we address the building sector? Do we address transport? Do we address uh, agriculture? I mean, there was nothing said by the judge on that. So that was completely led to political discretion. And of course, there's the increasing urgency that I try to show in the emission targets that are rising and rising and rising. So we will end up in a situation where courts can simply uh, only conclude that we should have reduced emissions in the past. Uh, it is, we are at the point that now we should not emit at all any longer to protect um, what the status quo to the extent we still can, no? to stay below whichever degrees. I mean, we heard we are well on track for three degrees. So let's see. Um, we will come to a situation that it is very difficult to leave the how to politics because time will run out. And again, agenda, we can see this because the state lost in 2015 and did nothing until December 2019 when it uh, lost in last instance. So then it had, uh, I think it was on the 19th of December, so it had something like 11 days left to address 
the emission targets for 2020. And then, of course, discretion had melted away on what could you do in these four years that passed in between. An epilogue, and just very, very short, why I included the shell case is we should also, when we think about separation of powers, never forget the international dimension. And the international dimension um, can be used for the good. Uh, that was very much what the first presentation was about, even though when I hear the ICJ is the highest court, it sort of makes me shake because I think there's no direct hierarchy. That's at least my, would be my argument, the legal argument that it's very difficult to say it in that form. But um, the point is that we have a lot of international law that plays a role and it's not always for the good. And here I want to just draw some attention to the recent cases under the Energy Charter Treaty of RWE and UNIPER that actually brought the Dutch state for billions. They, they brought claims against the Dutch state for billions of damages for climate action, basically, if you keep it very short, the phasing out of the coal-fired power plants. So the question is, when judges decide, it is never just a question of deciding or not deciding. First of all, judges are asked to give judgment and they have to take one position, which can be the denying jurisdiction, but that is also a decision. They must take a decision, be it not deciding. But when they don't, it doesn't mean that the case ends there. So the question is also, I felt that Shell was very much taking back control as the national embedded judiciary that is aware of environmental protection, that has constitutional norms to rely on, as opposed to a lot of arbitration, which is only growing, and I'm happy to discuss that in question and answers, under the Energy Charter Treaty, which so far numerically the majority of cases has been for renewable energy cases. So when re renewable energy sub subsidy or preferential schemes were ended, but first of all, their claims are always um, lower. So they were asking for millions as opposed to billions. And secondly, the fact that the Energy Charter Treaty protects the status quo is the most logical and convincing argument that in the future we will see a rise of these uh, carve out cases, a rise of fossil fuel industry relying on the Energy Charter Treaty to, to, um, to bring claims and to, to receive damages. And here, climate litigation is very essential to establishing legitimate expectations, to establish legal evidence that there is no legitimate expectation if you invest in fossil fuel industries in the year 2021, irrespective of what the Energy Charter Treaty said, there's no basis for a legitimate expectation that you will get full return because we have the Paris Agreement, we have the commitments to reduce emissions, and we know that the fossil fuel industry is the greatest problem. And when there are cases against Shell, they are on notice. They can no longer claim that they didn't know. And domestic law will feed into the fact finding of what are legitimate expectations. So this might have been a bit complex at the end. Um, I hope that um, I still entertained you sufficiently. And many thanks for listening to me. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Ekes. Thank you very much, uh, Christina. Uh, I, as I said, I was not too strict in uh, enforcing um, timing rules uh, in your case, especially for, uh, first of all, because your presentation was a very interesting one. Secondly, because I was very sympathetic with the small uh, I, uh, te technical difficulties that you experienced at the beginning. And third, because I learned that sometimes by interrupting and uh, uh, you make worse, things worse, because uh, the flow of uh, uh, thought is lost and the person has to start afresh. And um, But uh, thank you very much. It was a very rich presentation and uh, um, a lot to uh, take away. Uh, my first uh, thought, or my maybe that is not the main uh, point that you wanted to make, but uh, what uh, uh, I was I was particularly stricken by this by by, by this uh, thought. The um, we are as as lawyers, we tend to think that uh, uh, with the law or via the law, you can do almost everything. And but we know that in this uh, sector, in this field, the law is uh, uh, squeezed. Um, the lawmaking, the lawmaking process, is squeezed between politics and science. And um, when we move to litigation, that is also true, 
we judges are somehow squeezed between politics and uh, science themselves. And on top of that, you also have procedural rules which may provide a, a barrier. So uh, maybe we should uh, be sometimes at least more realistic and um, uh, uh, about what you can really achieve, by what can be really achieved by, by way of uh, um, by, by way of litigation. Um, anyway, that was very uh, interesting. Uh, it is now time for uh, questions and answers. Uh, uh, we have a question from uh, Professor um, uh, Claudio Di Turi, to whom I would like to give the floor if, he's, if he, he is able to uh, uh, make his voice heard. Um, let's see, uh, but I have also to tell uh, Claudio that uh, Professor Weverinke had to leave us because of an unexpected uh, situation. So um, my uh, proposal to him is would be to turn his uh, question into a comment. Um, Claudio, are you there? I'm not sure. I think Claudio uh, is gone too <laughs> because he wrote me that he has a meeting. Okay. Uh, so I, I'm not seeing him anymore. So I, I asked to, who has all the the list uh, appeared, but 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 due okay. to this message, I think that he, he could probably is no more with us. Anyway, his uh, his um, question is uh, in the chat, and that may be an uh, uh, element for reflection for everybody. I also had a question to Professor Weverinke, which I will uh, use, um, which I will share with you. And this may be, uh, well, uh, have, a, have the question, but there will be no answer. The question is to what extent, because this was not covered in her presentation, to what extent this initiative uh, will build upon the so-called in inverted commas or many inverted commas the case law of the icj with regard to advisory uh, opinions because that is also a very um, interesting um, element uh, to the to that process <laughs> so um the we there is also a question from uh, uh, luca panta uh, Luca Pantaleo, uh, I would like to, maybe uh, Luca, you can uh, um, put your question and then uh, we will give the floor again, not only to um, Silvia Xever, to whom the uh, question is addressed, but also to um, uh, Christina Ekes in case she wants to come back to on some of these uh, points. My idea would be uh, to um, close in uh, uh, 15 minutes or so, something like this, uh, in order to have our break. Uh, Luca, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Professor Schiano Di Pepe. Yes, I have written down already the questions on the uh, in the chat, so for the interest of time, I will just briefly uh, summarize them. The first question is for Silvia. And uh, well, you made a lot of interesting points, but I was a bit curious about your point concerning the integration of indigenous knowledge into climate regulation. I think that was your the, the your expression. So how that can be integrated, whether at national level, international level. So if you could uh, elaborate a little bit more on that. And then my question for Christina was asked a bit too early, I think, in the sense because she has addressed at least in part what I what I had raised uh, concerning the, the red lines uh, that you think should not be crossed by judges in this uh, integration of the role that politics is not playing, if I understand uh, correctly uh, uh, your point. Uh, so what is your understanding of the uh, of the limits? Uh, I, mean, I heard that you said that separation of power is is not a value in itself. Uh, I'm not entirely sure that I totally agree. And and the fact that it is not mentioned expressly, for example, in the treaties, I think it is the rule of law is mentioned, and I think it can be considered an integral part of it. Uh, but so I was a bit curious uh, on, on on this point. Thank you. Shall I start? 
Thank you very much, uh, Luca, for your question. And if I just may say, it's so great to see you again, even if it's just online. It's been a while. Um, right. Um, I think the uh, the key issue is your question is about uh, a, how this could be integrated. Uh, I would say definitely on all levels to start with, but even before we getting into the question of how it should be integrated, I think we need to take a step back um, because there, what is still missing there very much is that there is no consultation, no meaningful consultation at the least taking place with indigenous communities about what exactly is the is the impact in what way uh, uh, climate change and the other environmental factors uh, they impacting their daily lives. Their voices are still not heard there. It's still not addressed. Uh, I think Professor Eck, Eck has also mentioned that uh, there are so many voices that are still missing from these uh, these uh, excellent litigation efforts already we are seeing there. Um, so before we, we decide and discuss on how this knowledge should be integrated to make it as effective as, as possible, I think first of all we need to start talking to them and listening to them more importantly about what is the impact and what do they think that needs to uh, needs to happen in order to mitigate climate change impact and to adapt uh, to, to the changing climate, which is uh, uh, it's, it's an unstoppable process. We all, all we all know that. Um, right, so um, yeah, I, I think that's 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 the key concern uh, to start uh, uh, listening to them and start taking them seriously. And and you know, this, there is always a lot of discussion going on about decolonizing climate change, uh, decolonizing uh, um, a lot of things. So there's, it seems to be a fashionable term these days. And um, and uh, generally, the public assumes that decolonizing simply means to to make sure that indigenous people also get a seat at the table, right? Uh, but that's, with, with all due respect, that's uh, that's that's not decolonization. That's uh, it's not about making sure to for for them to have a seat at the table. Decolonization is really about destroying the table. The table has been put there by the colonial powers, and it, no matter how many how diverse uh, representatives you keep inviting and and make sure they have a seat at the table, you're still applying the same structures. We're still maintaining the same structures we have been put there in colonial times, which is about oppression, oppression, about silencing voices, about not taking them seriously, about not talking to them, not listening to them. So I think we really need to take the step back and reflect upon, OK, it's it's one thing to, to invite them, but do we really really listening to them and really acting based upon the knowledge we are receiving from them. So I'm, I'm not sure I'm answering your question at all, but um, once we once we, we have the information from them, once we, we change the old processes from uh, uh, simply inviting them to actually listen to them in a me meaningful way, um, not not much is going to not much not much is going to change and uh, and what in whatever way we go into uh, integrate indigenous knowledge into scientific knowledge, uh, it has to be on equal footing. It has to be on equal footing, um, because I also I, I I think I mentioned during uh, during the presentation is that uh, when we talk about extraction activities, uh, um, it's it's always. Uh, somehow justified or trying to be justified uh, with introducing the n narrative of development, right? We are bringing develop development to you, we are creating jobs and uh, so extraction activity starts and then there's a lot of inf infrastructure that needs to be built, which is also being built on, on indigenous land and adding to the loss of lands. Uh, and when indigenous people oppose this so-called development, um, then they always accuse, well, you are against development. Uh, but the, the thing is, they are not against development as such. They just want development on their own terms. So that again, going back to the point, do we ever really listen to them uh, and ask them what are their opinions, what are they, uh, um, yeah, opinions and, and knowledge about how to maintain the land, how to extract resources in a sustainable way? Um, yeah, so. I'm, I'm getting lost in my own toe, I'm afraid, so maybe maybe uh, Dr. Eckes will, can take over with the next question. Um, before we give the floor again to uh, Christina Eckes, I see that there is an additional uh, question on the, in the chat. So maybe uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Francesco Gallarati, who is a researcher at the University of Genoa. Francesco, if you are online and you want to put your question briefly, directly, 
to the speaker. Uh, if you are not able to, uh, we will just read it out. Uh, uh, yes, thank you, Professor, uh, and thank you all for this uh, very interesting uh, seminar. I wanted to ask uh, Christina Eckes, um, speaking about uh, the constitutional implications of climate litigation, if she had considered uh, whether the constitutional courts and more generally um, judicial review of legislation could play a specific role in tackling climate, climate change, since uh, uh, it is in the nature of a constitutional courts to interfere with the legislature and uh, uh, to deal with politic, uh, political issues. Uh, so maybe it is best, best positioned to address such uh, uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. And Christina, I, can, you, I think you can, you have, I would say something like uh, five minutes top uh, you're afraid of me now. I, uh, <laughs> that's well, why you give me clear limits. That's yeah, actually. I've treated you too well in the first. Um, I think so. Phase. Um, I want to ask. First of all, I want to start by asking the question myself. So I want to ask uh, one question to you, Sylvia, and that is, um, what do you think can the advisory opinion that we heard about the initiative, the proposal, the the, the request, um, do for yeah, the peoples that you focus on in research, so indigenous people in different places, do you have any expectation or do you say from the start, no general assembly is really state representation, so since it's Indonesia itself that is pursuing um, the West, West Papuans with military means, uh, there's no way that this process can do any justice to in, so is it, it's a bit the question that goes back to destroying the table or staying at the table because it's a question that I also myself struggle with in many respects because um, besides academically being interested in climate litigation, I've also become a bit involved as an advisor in the back uh, in the back chambers, let's say. And I think one core point, and that leads me to answering both um, your question, uh, the question on um, uh, well, combining several questions, but also going back to what is realistic, Lorenzo's comment at the beginning. So what can we ask of the um, of, of judges? And I think that is a constant struggle and it becomes nowhere more clear than a climate litigation, in my view, because you can only ask things that you can root in the law. Any argument needs to be re related based on the legal norms in that given jurisdiction. And it has to be pragmatic. If you go and ask for too much, that is the general assumption of all climate activists that I have worked with that can also fire back. So if you really deeply think about uh, international law principles, and that would have been my question if Margareta was still there, of uh, common but re um, differentiated responsibilities, what does that mean under international law? Doesn't that mean that, that, that we must do entirely different things? And what does that mean about adaptation? We can only say that plays a very minor role in, in the litigation that I look at. So litigation before domestic dick courts, as I would call it. And that has reasons, because if we took it anyhow seriously, it would mean that the Netherlands should start emit, stop emis, emitting today, not tomorrow, not in the year 2030, today. And that is, of course, something that you can ask no judge, because that is that would clearly be seen as going too far. So when you ask me where's the red line that judges can't overstep, well, it must be rooted in legally binding norms of the state and it must allow some further functioning of the state. And declaring an emergency in the sense of we must stop emitting now would lead nowhere because no one would follow it up and it wouldn't have any and it would be seen as illegitimate for the judge to take that position. So I think there's a strong tension between what is realistic and, and your suggestion of destroying the tables, which I understand. I'm not saying it's a, I, I have sympathy for it. The question is only that I can only deal on the table that is given to me. And I feel if I don't deal on that table, so if I say I don't engage with uh, climate litigation, I mean, the only thing I could still think is uh, Extinction Rebellion, but Extinction Rebellion is also fairly tame. Huh? So. <laughs> What what are the options of destroying the table? I don't think that is very easily seen for an academic. 
Um, that asked me to judicial uh, constitutional review. Constitutional review is a question of uh, national jurisdiction. In some countries you do have constitutional courts, in other countries you do not have constitutional courts. So the first question is, does your system have a constitutional court? And uh, Italy, of course, does. And what are, is the mandate of that constitutional court? What can the constitutional court do? And then, of course, there can be a lot of academic criticism if it does challenge national climate litigation. As some people have said, we should have done in Germany, so said that the Klimaschutzgesetz as such is not um, in line with the constitution, which is in principle possible in Germany, at least as a matter of principle, but which was not the content of the case, Neubauer, that I discussed of 2021. Um, it is, of course, even more far reaching. It is going saying the judiciary should um, challenge the political choices of the legislature in light of constitutional principles interpreted in light of science and international law. That's exactly the point I wanted to make. I by no means say that's not possible. I don't think it's a red line. I think in certain jurisdictions, such as Germany, that is absolutely possible. Um, and I think we could get there. Um, what is the red line for the judiciary? Yeah, I think there must be some... The judges must be aware of keeping political room to politics in the sense that if there is a possibility of drawing minimum lines like in agenda but leaving the how to politics that is a good choice in emphasizing that the legislature must take action but outlining the 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 legal obligations that's what judges in principle should do judges should not as the German Constitutional Court has in certain instances in the past, give a detailed prescription of what legislation should look like. I, I personally don't think that would be the right way for a judge, simply because then we are coming to a situation where, where we could ask ourselves whether we still have separation of powers, because then the continuous dialogue that I spoke about would end, because at least under the German system, if, if followed up, as the Constitution would require, then the Constitutional Court has had the last word. We are doing reducing emissions exactly as I say. And I would think that becomes problematic at the same time, as I've also acknowledged in my presentation, urgency is growing, scope for action is diminishing. I also think we will experience situations where many wish that courts had gone further. <laughs> So that is my honest expectation for my life and the life of my children. So uh, I think there will be the situation that you wonder to what extent the constitutional tenets yeah, worked well in this context. I don't say we should throw them overboard. I don't say that, just to be sure. But I think there's a reason why some scholars question whether democracies are well equipped to deal with the scope of the challenge. Not that I'm saying that autocracies have so far <laughs> fared any better. But the poor question of whether our system with our tenants is able to tackle this sort of problem is something that I can't answer. That's a question really that we can't answer. Thank you uh, very much. I think we will have to leave it uh, there. Um, we uh, have now the possibility of having a 10 minutes break. What a luxury. And we will, um, so I invite everybody to be back uh, uh, five minutes uh, uh, before 12 noon Italian time uh, for two more um, exceptionally interesting presentations. Please be punctual because uh, um, the next speaker has a very tight time window in which uh, he can speak because of other engagements. So we will try to uh, start on time and uh, finish on time as um, advertised in the fly. Thanks uh, so much for the time being for uh, excellent. I see already your uh, slides. So let me introduce you. It is very good to have you uh, here as a speaker at this um, uh, webinar. Professor Squintani, for the benefit of the audience, is a professor of energy law at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And uh, he is also a founding member of the a founder and a member of the man managing board of a um, uh, project called uh, Like Me Living Lab, whose uh, purpose is to study um, the improvement of the effectiveness of public participation practices in the field of energy and environmental 
uh, matters. Um, uh, Professor Squintani is also a um, founder and member of the management board of uh, uh, another important project, a U European Environmental Law um, Forum, as well as of the U4 Environmental Law uh, Network. He, uh, as an academic, he has uh, published uh, uh, widely in the areas of uh, European environmental law, European uh, energy law, and European climate uh, law. Um, he is therefore, therefore uh, perfectly placed to, um, uh, to uh, entertain us on the following topic. Uh, tort law as a means to ensure um, judicial protection, rise and fall of gender like cases in environmental law. By the way, this presentation uh, ties in very well with what we have just heard from Professor Eckes. Uh, Lorenzo, when we are ready, when you are ready, uh, the floor yes. is yours. Yes, thank you very much. I'm, uh, can you hear me well? We can hear you uh, perfectly well. I'm glad to hear this and hopefully also you can see my presentation full screen. Uh, so let's move on. No, yes, maybe. I cannot hear. Is the presentation visible? Yes, I can see it. OK, perfect. Uh, then I move on with uh, thanking the organizers for inviting me to present at this event and congratulate you, uh, all of you for having set up such a nice platform and for launching such a nice uh, initiative. So I'm also looking forward to the many more initiative about which Francesca was telling me when we had the brief talk a couple of weeks ago. And indeed, as Lorenzo was telling you, uh, my presentation ties quite well with that of uh, Christina, because I will go back to the matters of the Urgenda uh, ruling. And uh, in this ruling, we see uh, at the same time a new way of bringing forward environmental protection, climate law uh, litigation, namely. Um, but also, I would like to say, and I would like to stress today, a warning. A warning about the actually fundamental systematic failure in which uh, um, which agenda is making uh, evident uh, to everybody. So that's why I would like to uh, focus on the matters of tort law as a means to ensure effective judicial protection against planning and programs affecting the environment. Whether well, this can be successful, not successful, in which cases, what are the conditions and what are the possible solutions that we can um, discuss about in order to improve the functioning of the system. So, of course, we have already heard about it. Uh, Urgenda has been a great success, at least on paper. It was this uh, uh, landmark case changing uh, the way in which environmental protection was brought forward, not only in the Netherlands, but everywhere in the world, you could say, at least in many, uh, many more European countries, leading to a series of copycat cases, using a term um, expressed by Christina in, in, in several um, areas uh, of environmental law and in many other um, states in the Netherlands and abroad. Sometimes with success, sometimes with less success. And I will focus on, on, uh, on this dimension. Uh, of course, um, for any victory, there is always also a um, um, drawback somewhere. And the drawback was actually in Urgenda that, um, um, but let's say, let's put it frankly, Urgenda did not did not lead to the Netherlands achieving the goals set out in, in the field of climate change. The ruling of the judge in The Hague uh, was not complied with. The Dutch state did what it could, but uh, last week we received the final data from 2020 emission and the Netherlands uh, fell short by about 1.6% uh, uh, to meet the reduction target that it had set for itself originally and then was com uh, committed to, com uh, to comply with uh, by the Urgenda rule. So factually speaking, it's already been established Urgenda has failed to uh, lead to the um, compliance of the reduction targets that the Netherlands should have been complied with. But uh, there is more. On the, on the one end, Urgenda was followed uh, recently, and Christina was also referring to, to the uh, Milieu Defensi, 
uh, over winning against Shell. And here we see the, uh, the presidents of the Environmental Association really happy with the judgment provided by the, uh, the, the tribunal in, in that case. Uh, but the milieu defense is not only known in the Netherlands for bringing the uh, case against Shell. Milieu defense brings annually many, many cases of many, uh, against many, uh, many parties uh, in, uh, in the field of environmental law, mostly against the state. And there are other cases in which milieu defense has been bringing cases against the state. And in these other cases, we see a different outcome than the one that we have seen in Uganda. And I'm referring now to the field of air quality law. Um, milieu defense is inspired by Uganda before um, this guy even tried to bring uh, Shell to court, had launched a series of cases against the um, Dutch public bodies, mostly uh, municipalities, uh, for failing to comply. Lorenzo, I hate to interrupt you, but um, it seems there is a problem with the um, uh, slides, uh, meaning that we do not see your slides moving. I did not uh, intervene first earlier because I thought that that was only my problem. Now, yes. OK, then, uh, but I, I suppose that you are now seeing, not seeing the presentation mode. You are just seeing the... Uh, we are seeing not the presentation mode, but the slides are large enough for us to see what is written in that. So if the problem is the mode, I think you should stick to this mode and ensure that the slides keep on moving. Yes, let's do that for the <laughs> for the sake of taking our matters. Um, so, but what but the slides before were just picture of the um, um, components of the uh, Uganda um, NGOs and of the Middle Defense NGO, and now we can see a picture of uh, um, of um, taken related to the air quality cases brought by Milieu Defense against the five municipalities mentioned there: uh, Amsterdam, Arnhem, Severe, Utrecht, the, the Hague which is uh, Kelaya and uh, Rotterdam for uh, failing to comply with the European standards on uh, air quality. Uh, these cases were based on the same line of reasoning of uh, Urgenda, so were tort law based cases brought forward by NGOs thanks to the uh, friendly standing requirements that we have in the Netherlands in front of uh, civil courts uh, for bringing um, public uh, interest uh, litigations. Uh, science used as basis for the uh, for the findings uh, relying on the duty of care um, enshrined in, 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 um, in Dutch uh, civil law, but they failed. They failed terribly to convince the judge that um, action had to be taken, um, that uh, an extra measure had to be taken by the municipality to comply with the environmental air quality standards. Why? But what do we see in these cases uh, when we compare the Uganda ruling on the one hand, or to a great extent also the Shell case uh, on the one hand, and these uh, other cases uh, on the field of air quality, we can see these four differences. Um, it mo they move away from uh, a direct standing that we have had in Uganda. So Uganda was standing in front of the, of the court against the state uh, for failing to adopt a plant um, complying with the with the climate uh, um, targets agreed on under Paris uh, framework to indirect standing. In, in the cases in, in, the, in, the, in the area of air quality law, the court stated, no, you first have to try to submit an enforcement action on the side of the public authorities. If that fails, then and only then you can proceed against that failure to, to act and then rely on the underlying um, lack of um, ambitions or clarity of the uh, air quality plan um, established to comply with the European air quality standards. So there was this ex extra moment that has to be taken into account in order to bring a proceeding. So the request of enforcement procedure, the failure to take procedure, and then proceeding against that failure in order to challenge the original air quality plan that was considered to be insufficient. Um, then we move from a diffuse damage approach that we have in Uganda and also in Shell, 
um, against Ministry of Defense on the one hand, to a specific damage. In the air quality cases, the court required the uh, participants, the, the, the applicants, so there was on the one hand Ministry of Defense, the NGO, and other individual um, natural persons, to really show what was the damage that they suffered due to air quality law. General uh, health care um, issues were not uh, considered to be sufficient specific to um, to be complying with the just standards on um, tort law. And also on the next uh, typical um, um, tort law requirement, uh, regardless of which jurisdiction you are, the matter of a casual uh, link we see a difference in the uh, two line of cases. We have a weak causal link uh, discussion and assessment in uh, Urgenda and also in, uh, and even more actually, in, uh, in Shell on the one end, while we have a strong causal link requirement in the field of air quality law. So the court really goes in to say, you really have to show the connection between your specific damage and the failure to comply with the air quality standard to be successful. And then we go from a low burden of proof to a burden of proof in the sense that the uh, amount of scientific evidence provided for uh, supporting the, uh, the, 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 the general damage that was brought forward in the air quality cases was still considered not to be sufficient to convince the court of condemning the state or the public authorities, but they said, to do more than what they had done. So we see that there are systemic differences between the two cases, uh, which brought me to write in 2016, uh, taking over a point brought by um, a, co a colleague of, of, from the Netherlands, Malreen van Rijswijk, during a conference in, uh, in Italy on um, um, in, in um, environmental law in general, in uh, in common in 2018, that the organ is actually a system, a symptom of a failing system. First of all, public law seems to be unable to offer appropriate solution to climate change and to judicial protection. Public law seems to be unable to really protect the environment. There are not uh, apparently a, a system of enforcement of environmental standards coming down from Europe or from international bodies that uh, um, convince states and public authorities to first of all, avoid the damage, comply with the standards, protect the environment, mitigate climate change. And second of all, there is also a failure of um, judicial protection. Because why did the Urgenda before and milieu defense later go to the civil court simply because there was not the possibility to bring a public law case it was not possible to proceed against the state against the plans which is a public act um, in front of the administrative courts why because in the netherlands these kind of plans and uh, programs are not open for judicial review in front of the administrative body. Thanks to the so-called safety net construction that we have in the Netherlands, uh, private law uh, courts were open uh, for this kind of, uh, uh, of actions, and that's why Urgenda first and Milieu Defense later went through that route, opening up what is this the new wave of uh, um, climate litigation cases that we are seeing everywhere. Uh, in, in Europe, as discussed by uh, Christina. But it starts from a double level of failure, a substantive one, complying with environmental standards from public law perspective, and a procedural one, providing effective judicial protection in front of the judiciary, administrative judiciary. So let's focus a bit more on this failure, if you allow me. Uh, because what does it mean? Well, it all turns around the concept of plans and programs and what are what is the legal framework but well, first of all you know of course the trias of um, policy action that we um, that there is everywhere in the chain of decision making first you start with a nice policy document visions then indicating the targets you want to achieve then you translate them in plans and programs setting out the strategy on how to achieve these nice policy visions um, more and more political oriented uh, plan of programs which then form the framework for um, allowing or in any case steering the adoption of specific action, being the projects, being the decision, being the general bonding rules, also general schemes of subsidies, for example. Um, but they are always, you know, a kind of implementation of plans and programs. Now, um, how does it work? As you perfectly know, 
and the chain of decision making is also regulated under the ARUS Convention, that is international treaty uh, aiming at ensuring uh, environmental democracy and therefore that the people is, uh, has access to information, access to public participation and access to justice against you know, specific action, plans and programs and policy visions. Uh, there are of course difference in the stringency of the framework depending on whether it is uh, about a specific act or uh, an higher um, public um, acts such as a plan or even um, fewer obligation, even very vague reference to what can, is, can be done against policy visions, uh, but the framework is composed in any case by these three. Pillars. Um, in the context of public participation, we of course know that public participation should be allowed as regards all these three levels of decision making, um, but actually this does not always go so well, because what happens now people participate, then they have a feeling that the participation process was a fake participation, and then they start protesting. This is a famous picture of an event that took place in the Netherlands um, a couple of years ago, uh, which led really to, um, to really tension in the um, whole of the, of the municipality which was holding the meeting. Um, and then you will expect, if there is social unrest, that you can go to court. But actually, as I explained to you before, that is not easy at all. Um, why? Because uh, there are no real uh, legal basis to bring a case in front of the court and civil law is considered too curbensome and therefore people just start to protest in a more, um, in a less organized manner. Are um, solutions possible? In theory, there are. If you check in Germany, in Germany they um, now seem to have recently, a couple of years ago, passed an, an amendment allowing direct access to justice against plans and programs covered by the Special Environmental Assessment, uh, Strategic Environmental Assessment Directive. Uh, you can discuss whether this is mandated or not. I refer in this case to the concept of green plating, which is a more environmentally friendly term than gold plating. That's another presentation for another day, uh, but that in any case, that is exactly the discussion I would like to do with you today, because is it required by EU law to provide judicial protection against plan and programs? Now, first of all, what is a plan or a program? Under the, um, the directive, it is referred to as an act of public authority, regulating special planning, setting out the framework, specific rules, and this has been defined and refined in many, many cases, mostly from Belgium. In Belgium, this is a very heightened uh, question. So recently, uh, the Belgian court explicitly asked the Court of Justice to reconsider the broad definition to, uh, given to plan and programs. The Court of Justice did not uh, redefine that, uh, um, that definition. So as you you can see there is this element of being a, an act of a public authority and uh, does not need to be required as long as mentioned somewhere in a uh, public uh, act and then um, this must or, or be of a special um, planning element so regulating the use of a space in the in the landscape or being setting out the framework for specific measure. So basically saying something about what the um, public authorities must do at the level of permitting, authorization or um, other specific actions. So it's very broad definition. No doubt that uh, air quality plans will fall uh, under that uh, definition and also climate plan will fall under that uh, definition. Yet the directive is completely silent about judicial protection. The directive provides no explicit obligation to ensure judicial uh, protection against plans and programs. Uh, yet, yet, you could say that uh, based on the case law, the Court of Justice and the provisions of the treaties and the charter mentioned on the slide in Article 19.1, so effective judicial protection, Article 47, effective judicial protection, Article 9.3 of the Arus Convention, uh, which is the kind of actual popularis uh, uh, provision in that convention and specific uh, um, directive, in this case, this, uh, the SIA directive, there is a duty to ensure effective judicial protection against plan 
and programs. And you could try to read this interpretation in a series of cases the, uh, from Slovenia, uh, the uh, Vika L2 case, or the Protect one from uh, um, Austria. And you could say, although these cases were about the Habitats Directive, that you could also recognize the line of reasoning but, uh, more vaguely, I'll say yeah, by analogy with a question mark, in the air quality cases focusing on Janacek, which is about the quality directive, and the RVA case, which is about the uh, national emission ceilings uh, directive, where you always see that there is this right to be able to challenge public acts, including planning programs, when this is affecting the um, fruition of a right, in that case established by a directive. But how does it work? Um, but first of all, the question of whether it should be direct and indirect. You remember in the uh, air quality cases from the defensive, the judge said, first of all, before coming to me, you have to ask for an, uh, act, an enforcement action. And only if they fail to do so, and, and uh, you bring proceeding against that failure, then you can also challenge the uh, underlying plan, air quality plan. So that is an indirect action mentioned by the uh, Dutch uh, court, but indirect action costs time. You have seen in Uganda, it took, uh, took so much time for Uganda to win the case that by the time that the Dutch government was instructed to do something, it was actually too late to do something. And now we find out that it was not possible to achieve the goals set out in that sentence. Um, so that's why I would suggest, based on the VKL2 judgments, that there is actually more uh, pressure on having direct action rather than having um, indirect action, because this leads to sooner solution, so that the problem is uh, prevented rather than uh, solved. Uh, moreover, direct action can lead to annulments, while indirect action, at least in the Netherlands, but also in other countries, they um, will in it bring only to the annulment of the specific act which triggered the initial proceeding. In the Netherlands, and this could vary from jurisdiction to, ju to jurisdiction, the court will rarely also start to question the uh, validity as such of the underlying plan. It will most probably be simply declared not applicable in that specific case, but it will not be declared inadmissible unless ultra uh, virus. There are very strict exceptions in, in that case. Um, moreover, direct action preserves participatory rights because it's a bit strange to participate about the content of a plan or program, saying that it's not going fur, uh, further and uh, strict enough, it's not ambitious enough, and then not be able to go to court to challenge event or shortcoming in that past, uh, participatory procedure. So you see a reference also in the Commission noted to access to justice, to um, the importance of ensuring effective judicial uh, protection. Hence, based on this um, different piece of um, evidence that you can find in case law, um, international law being part of European law and commission notice, I will have um, as a conclusion a preference for direct action against plan and programs. And that is actually my suggestion. Uh, reform this, uh, the Strategic Environmental Assessment Directive, make clear where necessary, that there is also a right to access to justice to challenge plan and programs, make this also clear in the field of climate law, because also there we don't have clear reference to access to justice rights, so that cases such as Urgenda and uh, media defense can take place in front of the administrative court as soon as a plan of programs has been presented, which is deemed not to be capable of achieving the environmental goal, it should be aiming at complying with. And if that works, probably we could say that Uganda rises again, or truly in the sense that has brought about a substantive and procedural improvement of the functioning of environmental law. Thank you very much for your attention. And if later you have any questions about the content of my presentation, feel free to ask. Thank you very much, uh, Lorenzo. You were very clear and fast on time. Uh, as I said, next speaker has a very uh, limited time frame, so I will not comment on your um, presentation. I will come back to that later. I will also use 
the usual uh, word, the next speaker does not need any introduction, so that we can move directly to his presentation. Of course, this will be by Professor uh, Marcus Gehring, who is um, a director of uh, um, the Center for European Legal Studies at the University of Cambridge. The topic that he will entertain us with is climate-related investment claims. Um, a special thank you, Professor Gehring, for being with us today, for sharing your time, uh, your precious time with us today. Without, without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you so much to the organizers, and 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 sorry for uh, um, uh, for for this uh, uh, slight slight delay. Um, I'm looking at investment claims, and uh, the organizers have these slides. They can share. Uh, they can be shared with the audience. And I apologize uh, that uh, we are in the middle of admissions interviews. Um, so I'm doing this in uh, the break time between uh, talking to uh, 40 students in one session after another. So um, I should highlight that this is part of the research program that we started some years ago with sustainable development and world investment law. But the reflection now is how do investment claims relate to climate change? And can we maybe call some forms of investor state arbitration uh, as a, a subform of climate litigation, the, the, the topic of your wonderful symposium today? Now, you will be familiar, and I will skip these slides, uh, that investment law and climate change doesn't have a black and white relationship. Some investor protections are good for uh, climate change. For example, when they protect renewable energy projects, some other uh, protections, uh, for example, for investments of coal-fired power plants or coal mines is uh, slightly more doubtful. So the question that I think we need to ask is how do we uh, perhaps make changes to the international investment law agreements so that they foster, not frustrate, sustainable development more broadly and climate protection more specifically. Um, there's a long history, especially under NAFTA Chapter 11, of slightly doubtful rulings on regulatory changes. So that is a problem um, if investment law is used to attempt to strike down regular uh, regulatory changes. Uh, this was in part solved by an interpretative statement by the parties to the NAFTA agreement. And now the USMCA, the T NAFTA 2.0, has actually eliminated the possibility of uh, US, Ca Canada uh, or Canada US uh, disputes. The dispute ISDS still applies to Mexico in full. But the new text also makes it clear that legitimate environmental regulation should not be subject to investor state claims. Um, can we promote investor confidence, wise regulations, and more sustainable investments? I think so. Uh, it requires some textual changes that I will come back to afterwards. And, and there are some uh, relatively positive uh, uh, agreements. Uh, for example, uh, in the Parkering Arbitral Award, public interests could be included in the assessment of like circumstances. And that is perhaps the connection also to uh, the question about or agenda, private law instruments. Whenever we have an open legal concept, offener Rechtsbegriff, as we say in German, uh, there is the possibility of the Paris Agreement, especially the long-term target, to influence the assessment also for the investment arbitrators. But these are not just theoretical questions uh, because um, we've done a little bit of analysis of the most recent cases and more and more cases concern climate change, concern 
a level of uh, climate litigation. You have uh, the R, um, RWE case, you have the Uniper cases, uh, and then you have wind power cases, um, solar park cases, um, and the very interesting case in Koch Industries, and I apologize for the spelling mistake on the slide, um, uh, because uh, the province of Ontario with the political change uh, phased out the um, emission trading scheme that uh, had been launched. And COP Industries uh, had bought emission allowances and was then not compensated for those allowances. So a really interesting case. Uh, there are really difficult questions about the definition of an investment and whether uh, just uh, having these allowances, uh, uh, having these allowances really counts uh, for the investor protections. But nonetheless, it highlights that investment protection is uh, not a one way street. It uh, cuts both ways and in that sense is very much a double edged sword. So the question going forward, if we if we then uh, uh, look at some of the other cases uh, you in Italy will be familiar with cases like um, Encavis, um, and then there is quite a host of cases of Spanner, Spanish solar cases, some with very interesting outcomes, some problematic from the point of view of uh, the ACMEA arbitration and the, the decision uh, in the Court of Justice of the European Union, but um, more often than not, defending the renewable energy investment, which I think is sometimes uh, not really evaluated by some of the environmental activists who, who just see all forms of investor state arbitration as uh, somehow nefarious. Um, so what is needed? Uh, I think there are ways to accommodate climate change in uh, in investment in international investment agreements. Um, we heard about uh, plans and programs. I would add that assessment and sustainability reviews are absolutely necessary and not enough countries are actually engaged in them. Uh, there also needs to be much stronger transparency provision. We recently uh, published um, the uh, book on the UNCITRAL rules and um, uh, and um, the uh, the related convention, but that is a bare minimum. And we've seen exit uh, the exit transparency change actually enter into force this week. Um, what else can be done? Textual changes are possible. So stronger references to climate change to sustainable development in the preamble that uh, adds the color and shading for the interpretation of the investment agreement. And uh, new provisions, progressive provisions on exceptions like circumstances, uh, environmental treaties in general, I think uh, would be quite useful. Um, the two of the most progressive agreements that we've seen in recent years uh, remain the uh, EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement, even though it uh, does not uh, contain an uh, ISDS, an investment chapter as such, it does um, it contain investor protections, especially in the services chapter. And uh, what this agreement does, it contains a very strong material breach uh, uh, provision in Article 764, which declares the fight against climate change as one of the bases of cooperation, and then um, adds even stronger language on uh, defining climate change as an existential threat to humanity and to respect the Paris Agreement and the UNFCCC uh, process. It also defines separately the climate level of protection 
um, in setting a target for uh, 2030 and uh, then having provisions that if the respective parties, so either the EU or the United Kingdom, uh, do not meet these targets uh, uh, for the legal consequences. And of course, that sets the framework for the investment protection under that agreement as well. Um, and so the, despite the, the lack of ISDS in the uh, TCA in the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, we do find that making climate change a make it or break it issue in a trade agreement that has investor protections is uh, a significant way forward. Another good example um, uh, is the CHI. We all know that the China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, the CHI, is on ice. Also because uh, China has sanctioned some of the members of the European Parliament. Um, I'm not sure how many uh, uh, Chinese leaders actually realize that the Parliament has to approve the agreement before it can enter into force. But that's one of the, um, uh, some of the pleas that I would have. I think you need to um, understand the European Union and EU external relations much better uh, before you embark on sanctioning parliamentarians. Nonetheless, it contains for a standalone investment agreement some of the strongest language on climate change and therefore, in my view, sets an example. It says in Article 6 on investment in climate change and granted this is a part of the sustainable development chapter of the CHI, which is not subject to the normal uh, ISDS or even dispute settlement provisions, but follows the expert process that we are so familiar with in EU FTAs. And it says that uh, the parties, each party shall effectively implement the, the UNFCC uh, and the Paris Agreement adopted there under, including its commitment with regards to its nationally determined contributions. So it would have been, if it had been um, adopted, it would have been the first international agreement that actually uh, gives some legal force to the NDCs, to these international promises under the Paris Agreement uh, that in my view also have a broader importance for uh, investment law. Because in a way the country is promising what they're going to do domestically and internationally under the Paris Agreement. And in my view, that must have an impact on investment law, especially the open legal terms such as fair and equitable treatment. Uh, so nonetheless, the, the, the CHI making the naturally determined contributions uh, quasi binding is the step in the right direction for investment law uh, more more broadly. So what is my conclusion in this uh, very short presentation? I apologize again um, for the brevity of this presentation. I think the transition to a green economy with benefits in the fight against poverty is genuinely manageable uh, without raising investment concerns, just like environmental objectives could be achieved in other areas. While some investment rules could pose limit on climate policies if carefully crafted, they either don't give rise to investment concerns or can be defended based on their public policy objective. Room for improvement of investment rules exists. The link to the Paris Agreement and corresponding justifications should be made much clearer. In my view, regulatory chill is largely a matter of perception when elements to reduce investment concerns are considered and further research on the interaction between domestic climate measures and investment rules is advised. And that concludes my rapid uh, presentation. Thank you very much to the organizers and please feel free uh, to share my slides in the process. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, uh, clear uh, presentation that uh, brought us into the world of the
climate or environmental related uh, provisions in uh, treaties or agreements which belong uh, um, structurally to other fields, which is a long standing issue um, in the academia, but uh, of course is brought to a new uh, importance and significance in the present context. I'm not sure whether you have the time to stick for a couple of more minutes around if there are any uh, questions from uh, the floor. Oh, yeah, Jim. Uh, Absolutely, I would be delighted. Edwin, I ben in a conference. Uh, uh, there is and a Q&A, precisely. Please, please uh, shut your mic, close your mic if you are not a speaker. No, or if you are asking a question. Qualcuno ha il microfono acceso, chiedo di spegnerlo per cortesia, per evitare confusione. Professor Eckes has a question for you, I think, or maybe for um, the former speaker. Cristina, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, hi, Marcus. Nice to see you. Um, I have a question with regard to the Energy Charter Treaty. Um, I understand that you say, for example, in the CHI, there's specific references to national determined contributions. And, um, and I understand that that could, uh, yeah, when you say quasi legally binding, this could be a step forward even from their bindingness under the Paris Agreement. But let's uh, go back to the Energy Charter Treaty. And we have references in the Energy Charter Treaties, I'm sure you're aware, to the UNFCCC. We have references to environmental protection, but only, let me see, something like 15 days ago, a report came out reviewing 64 of the whatever, 78, I mean, I'm doing the numbers a bit vaguely, awards that were publicly available or otherwise accessible. And the conclusion, which I think you could say, of course, is written by the Climate Change Council, so it's written from a perspective of identifying the problems, is that there is no value given to make it shorter. I mean, the report is obviously long, I can share it in the chat, but um, the conclusion is that there's very little attention given to the textual references that could be an opening to protect the environment or climate change. And the expectation therefore is that, um, as I said at the end of my presentation, which I understand you had to miss, that there will be many more cases because the fact is simply revisionist amendment is not easy. So let's assume for the moment that uh, reforming the Energy Charter Treaty will simply not be possible despite efforts um, from the Commission and member states. And um, so we are stuck to the treaty as it is. And um, it protects the status quo, so it, it protects investments that have been made. And numerically, I also said that in my presentation, we have more renewable energy cases. I fully give that to the Energy Charter Treaty. But what is your expectation to the future? Because, um, I mean, we all know we will have more um, emission reduction legislation in whatever form, yeah, climate change laws in different contexts. And therefore, the fossil fuel industry, and is my expectation, will bring more of the RWE UNIPER cases, which I have to share, um, is very influential in the Netherlands. Huh? It does affect policymaking. So I do think that if you wanted to find evidence for regulatory chill, you must speak to the current government in the Netherlands and you have evidence of it. I'm not saying it's true everywhere and in all extent, but I think RWE and UNIPER cases of billions, not even millions in damages, has an impact on Dutch politics. And I'm willing to make that specific claim factually hard. I would like to hear your reaction, your expectation of what happens to the Energy Charter Treaty and whether you also equally positively look at that particular treaty. Before uh, Professor Gehring answers, I, I would like to ask uh, uh, Professor Pantaleo, who to uh, also raise his put his uh, question, uh, Luca, please uh, um, feel free to intervene. Yes, thank you very much, Professor Schiano di Pepe, and thank you, Professor Gehring, for your for your interesting presentation. I just wanted to ask a quick question. You mentioned the uh, TSD chapters, trade and sustainable development chapters, or single provisions included in trade and investment agreements, like the one with China, 
uh, that can uh, bring the integrate to a certain extent, uh, let's say, environmental and climate change obligations into these agreements. But the criticism that we often hear uh, is that these provisions are, for the most part, not binding. You said quasi binding. Uh, and uh, that they, they are not subject to the to the dispute settlement mechanisms that are usually included in these uh, agreements. And if there is if there is a separate dispute set, uh, dispute settlement mechanism, that also is not binding. So I was wondering uh, whether you would argue for a we would advocate for a further integration, uh, or if you think that well a trade and investment agreement remains such and, and that the two things should not be uh, well, th those uh, uh, things should not be pursued through uh, trade and investment agreements thank you um okay i think uh, we stop here as far as questions are concerned we give the floor briefly to professor Gehring. i then would like to ask a question to professor squintani if time time allows but first uh please uh professor Gehring, um take the floor again and try to address these important and complex questions. Yes, thank you very much. If I uh, start with uh, Professor Pantaleo's question uh, first and then uh, go back to Christina's, uh, Professor Ecke's uh, uh, excellent question. Um, I, I think, uh, I, I was always very skeptical about the SD chapters and, and sort of isolating and, and creating silos for sustainable development because I think it cuts across so many areas of the agreement. On the other hand, we shouldn't underestimate the, the power of the expert processes, especially if the result is made public, right? Uh, you can equally ignore a trade dispute settlement uh, outcome under a free trade agreement if you are so inclined. But we've seen that the persuasive value of these expert decisions, it tends to be quite high because in, in a way it, it sort of, even though it doesn't have a direct impact on the trade relationship, it does have a direct impact on the general reputation. And we've seen that the parliament of South Korea acted very swiftly after South Korea lost the uh, dispute about the ILO um, convention and implementation. Um, on the other hand, we've also heard that the Director General of DG Trade last week in the European Parliament announced publicly that the new uh, approach will be to make core provisions of the sustainable development chapter subject to dispute settlement. And I think that's the right approach. Not every single provision should be subject to potential trade sanctions, but certain key commitments, and I would include the full implementation of the Paris Agreement uh, as one of those provisions, could be subject, could be taken out of the expert process and submitted to the normal trade dispute process. I, I think it makes negotiating these agreements slightly trickier. Uh, there might be, uh, especially if the EU is the demandeur, more trade-offs that will have to be made with the trading partner. But I think that's the right direction of travel. And we've seen, in my view, a very successful strategy play out for the Commission in the TCA, right? The TCA is probably the second most hated agreement in the United Kingdom after the withdrawal agreement at the moment and the political classes are up in arms, but I consider it a huge victory for the European Union in the process, maybe, you know, uh, showing some of the torture instruments uh, before these provisions were uh, agreed, but I don't think there's any way back. I think the genie is out of the bottle with regards to making climate change a make it or break it issue, a material breach issue. And even though that is more symbolic because you could walk away from the TCA uh, with a six month notice, uh, so you don't need the material breach provisions. It nonetheless highlights what the value is that underpins the trading relationship. And that brings me to um, the uh, excellent report uh, by Climate Council 
uh, I was uh, I had long discussions with Annette and her team in Glasgow on this report. Um, I know that some of my um, uh, sort of arbitration colleagues have some issues with some of the uh, conclusions, but I think largely they're correct. And why are they correct? It's because the parties determine what the submissions is. And I, I tell you a little story. I was advising the city of Hamburg for the first Vattenfall case, where water permits were uh, denied to a coal-fired power plant. Not because the water permits were uh, a big issue, but because the new government with the Green uh, Social Democrat coalition didn't want a new coal-fired power plant in the heart of the city of Hamburg. So we made submissions after submissions to the federal government, the German federal government. And what did the German federal government do? They ignored the climate elements. They didn't even mention it in their submissions to the arbitrators because they said, look, arbitrators are very traditional people. They don't look at these things. And, you know, climate change is such a newfangled issue. I completely disagree. I think there's a new generation of arbitrators fully steeped in the importance of climate change. And I think it's going to be the arbitrators in the process that will trigger that change. But for that, we need submissions like the one in Urbasar, like the one where the parties actually argue that investors also have obligations in order to trigger that change. And it hasn't happened yet. Why? Because sovereign governments are very risk averse in my view. I find it hilarious that a government like the Netherlands feels the strain of regulatory chill when their entire country is going to go under in a hundred years if we don't act decisively on climate change, right? So for me, it's also seeing the uh, broader political issue and the existential threat, as the TCA calls it, uh, of climate change in the process is the uh, is the textual basis of the current energy charter treaty capable of accommodating that? Absolutely, yes. Would it be helpful to have further clarifications in textual changes? Absolutely, yes, at all uh, as well. And I, I'm not sure where the uh, where the Commission is at because they threatened to walk away from the energy charter treaty altogether. I mean, that could have um, uh, there, yes, and there's, uh, of course, uh, you can build very high dams in the Netherlands. Uh, so maybe this threat to uh, the Netherlands is less existential than to Bangladesh. But on the other hand, uh, I think um, uh, Christina is right. There is some problem. There is a problem with the current version of the Energy Charter Treaty because uh, the arbitrators are not, and the, the parties in their submissions are not using the full gamut of textual provisions that that, in my view, relatively progressive investment agreement already allows for. Um, but that's why perhaps further clarifications are necessary. And if not, I wouldn't be surprised if the European Commission walks away from the Energy Charter uh, treaty altogether. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, since we have um, a couple of minutes left, uh, I would like to uh, give the opportunity to Professor Squintani, who has spoken uh, for a more limited time um, because of the uh, structure of this second panel, um, to come back to a question, to an issue that he uh, briefly raised. And the issue is the one of uh, greenwashing. Because I think that greenwashing litigation is somehow the stone guest here. Um, as someone uh, among you may know, um, what is thought to be the first uh, judicial order in the question of uh, greenwashing was rendered by a local court in Italy, uh, Tribunale di Gorizia, uh, at the end of last year. That is, of course, a business to be, that was in the context of a business to business B2B litigation a business complaining of unfair competition from another business because of the claims that uh, 
uh, defendant was making regarding the origin of the products used and the processes used in uh, um, in the context of their of its uh, um, uh, industrial uh, activity and uh, that was of in a sense that was also a tort law case because unfair competition at least for uh, italian uh, standards uh, amount to um, uh, tort uh, uh, law um, so uh, I would like to hear from Professor Squintani whether he has uh, any thought on that, uh, although that was not in the uh, scope of his uh, uh, presentation, uh, strictly speaking. Um, uh, Lorenzo, are you there? Are you yes, I'm here. Thanks, Lorenzo, for the for the questions. So allow me, please, to broaden it uh, a little in the sense that uh, what um, uh, your example brings forward to the forefront is the fact that not all actions, not that there needs to be integration and holistic approach to the way in which you protect the environment in the sense that um, an environmental legislation originally or, uh, was generated in a silos that was also mentioned before by other presentations and uh, uh, was not well integrated into other uh, policy areas such as consumer law, competition law and uh, um, state aid, uh, public procurement, just to mention a uh, few, even energy. Uh, no, the, the energy law has always been, at, 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 it, despite stemming from environmental law you know, at European level, originally speaking, with 192 saving a space for many um, energy um, pieces of energy law nowadays, still has had a more uh, broader approach to, uh, um, to the matter than what required at times to really ensure an holistic approach. So what do we see there is that uh, we had pieces of legislation that were not suitable for the uh, for the task. And then you had to come up with creative solutions in order to uh, bring forward um, the, the public good of the environmental protection, leading also to the kind of cases that you have been uh, mentioning. And in this regard, rather than delving into the specificity of, green, of greenwashing, I would like to um, actually refer to the fact that thanks to the Green Deal, we probably have the first serious holistic reform in the field of EU law related to energy transition, and environmental protection, and climate mitigations um, since the establishment of the uh, of the European Union. Under the Green Deal umbrella, we are seeing coming up actions that indeed are bringing together different fields of, uh, of policy and circular economy being being a nice example of that in which we see not only environmental legislation moving forward but we also see uh, product standards consumer law internal market uh, dg working towards a more um, environmental conscious um, standard setting on their in, on their own dg uh, departments so in that sense it can only be welcome the fact that also the standards in the field of competition law are greening up. Here yeah, we always are confronted with the rigidity of the regulatory framework for competition law, which stems from primary law, which is actually primary law, and therefore is difficult to, uh, to amend. But consumer law is in a sense um, greening up and therefore also the requirement on um, auditing and, and, and public procurement and uh, the requirement also on sorry, not public procurement, but on, uh, um, on, on the corporate governance are providing more insight and stronger basis um, to help then parties accountable for not respecting environmental standards. I hope Lorenzo that somehow I also provide an answer to your question. Uh, yes, that was uh, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, there are many, um, there are many places to uh, look at uh, in order to be fully updated on what happens in the realm of uh, climate litigation. So um, I'm not sure whether uh, Francesca, you want to uh, take the opportunity to say a few uh, uh, conclusive words. Um, or uh, should I just uh, uh, go on with uh, uh, conclusive uh, formalities? You can go on with formalities. I just want to thank you all for being there in this uh, very <laughs> complex <laughs> time and with uh, some uh, unpredictable events that has uh, been 
with us and making today's reflection so rich uh, and so inspiring. So for me, just the words for thank you on everyone in his role and the students for being here and uh, be back in the afternoon with the session for the diplomacy session. Uh, so the floor is uh, now yours for the formalities, as, as you said. <laughs> thank you very much, Francesca. Once again, congratulations on the success of this webinar and more in general on your appointment as uh, Jamone chair for the in relation to this important project. Uh, very heart heartfelt thanks to the speakers who um, uh, uh, gave us a lot to think about and uh, um, uh, by delivering very uh, rich and uh, um, thought provocative uh, presentations. And uh, again, um, thanks to the audience, students and colleagues who uh, took the time to um, share, uh, well, to in intervene and uh, uh, attend this, uh, this event and especially to those who put uh, uh, questions to the speaker. It was my speakers. It was my honor and privilege to chair this event, and I look uh, very much forward to seeing all of you uh, in person um, in Italy or around the world. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Arrivederci. Mm. Donc, ouais. Donc ouais, per, per...